Okay, um, calling the meeting to order on June twelfth at three thirty. Uh, roll call. Miss Snell here. Miss Matoyer here. Miss Floor. Mr. Davenport here. Miss Franco here. Miss Black. Miss Yelsey here. Dr. Navarro here. Okay. Uh, any cards? No cards. No cards. Okay. Um, so we will go into closed session. Dr. Diagostino will be in with you guys. Okay. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Meeting to order, um, June 12th at 6.04. We apologize for being late, but the um, we had a retirement ceremony and it went over a little bit, so we ate in 10 minutes. <laughs> okay, um, we are going, I have a readout, and that is in closed session, the board took action to release and non-reelect five temporary certificated employees Pursuant to Education Code Section 44954, effective at the end of the 2017-18 school year, and directed the superintendent or designee to send out appropriate legal notices. The roll call vote was as follows, ayes 7, noes 0. So, oh yes, I'm moving on. Okay, so, um, we are going to start with a moment of reflection and a pledge of allegiance to the flag. Are you going to lead it, Van? Sure thing. Okay. Sure. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so adoption of agenda. So move adoption of the agenda. Second. Okay, so the adoption of the agenda was moved by Ms. Franco and seconded by Mr. Davenport. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, adoption of minutes from May 22nd, 2018. Move adoption of the minutes of uh, May 22nd, 2018. Second. Okay, it, wa um, it was moved by Ms. Floor, seconded by Ms. Yelsey. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, and I wasn't here, so I. You, that's okay. Abstain. You're Abstain. Fine. Oh, I, oh, okay, I'm fine. I'm fine. Yeah, <laughs> any any no's? Okay. Um, okay, so now we're moving on to the recognition. Dr. Navarro. Okay, for this first one, I'm going to go down to the podium. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. <laughs> so as you know, it's become tradition to recognize some outstanding seniors. Uh, from this year's class, and these seniors are exemplars of the incredible character of our students across the district. And each year we ask schools to nominate students who best epitomize the qualities of each character trait that we teach in our school district. So I'd first like to ask uh, Dr. Bolton to come up from Newport Harbor High School. Okay, we'll find him later. <laughs> okay, uh, let's get uh, Mr. Halt from. Uh, he just went out to look. He just went out to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Navarro. Uh, mem members of the board, uh, it's my pleasure to actually recognize two uh, outstanding members from Estancia. Uh, the first uh, uh, eagle I'd like to call forward is Miss Emily Kabitsky. Emily came to Estancia three years ago, and you could tell right away that she was going to be especially going to make great contributions. She's been a member of our band for three years and a standout member of our softball team for three years. Uh, she was nominated and received uh, the award for, uh, for fairness, and I'd like to uh, read a couple of uh, ways in which uh, Emily constantly models this. 
Um, Emily consistently models fairness by listening to all points of view during activities, lessons, and she upholds the expectations of leadership and collaboration uh, in the classroom setting. She is a link leader at Estancia, which is a program designed to help with the freshman transition, uh, and works daily with a group of 12 freshmen, uh, helping, build, uh, helping lead team building activities, set positive examples, and encourage them to do better. She actively uh, um, helps students participate uh, in a positive way. When freshman students experience disagreement, Emily facilitates positive communication and it helps uh, all parties understand different points of view. She pursues positive solutions to all problems. Uh, her ability to uh, work hard and uh, um, play fair is, is also evidenced on the softball field where she exemplifies the CIF models of victory with honor. Emily will be graduating and will going on to um, uh, UC, I'm sorry, to San Jose, San Jose State uh, where she plans on majoring in environmental engineering. I'm sorry, environmental science. Yes. <laughs> I actually had this written down, uh, but uh, <laughs> clearly stumbled. So, uh, <laughs> Emily, you're wonderful. I'm not, but you're great. Uh, the next senior I'd like to recognize is Mr. Jimmy Brown. All right. You can stand next, next to uh, Dr. Navarro, look back at your mom. I'm sure, I hope the board won't mind the back. Uh, James was nominated and received the award for uh, outstanding, outstanding citizenship. Uh, James contributes to Estancia in many ways beyond academics. Uh, he's a peer mentor to ninth grade students in our, uh, as a link crew leader, and he actively participates in Estancia's youth and government program and has done so for three years. He currently serves as our delegation president. James is a member of uh, Estancia's LEO Club uh, through the LEOs International and the Interact Club through the Rotary Club, uh, which both promote leadership and responsible citizenship. James is also a peer tutor and has volunteered at local homeless shelters and helped contribute uh, and help coordinate food and clothing drives. Uh, James is all about uh, politics and making our community better, which is why we are proud to nominate him for the category of great citizenship. Upon graduation, uh, Jimmy is going to be going to uh, UCLA, where he's going to have a major that is way too difficult for me to say. Uh, it is. And trust me, if I got Emily's wrong, there's no way I was getting that one right. Okay, next, I'd like to bring up uh, Dr. Haley. Yes, and I would like to welcome up Zaid Batarse up here. Come on, for responsibility. Come on up, Zaid. You've got to love events like this when you have the pillar of responsibility because you know Zaid's going to show up. Uh, uh, Zaid has uh, participated in our marching band at Costa Mesa, the luxury of a 712 school, for five years. Uh, he's been a drum major of the band for the past two years. He has been a fantastic, responsible role model for all of his peers. He makes sure everyone is informed, included, and represented. He extends his responsibility to the whole school with school spirit at various school events. 
He mentors young members of the middle school and volunteers to work with our elementary students during the summer. He always shows love and care for Costa Mesa High School and his fellow peers. He's taken the school leadership role seriously, whether a mentor, running community events, or fundraising. His responsibility runs regular meetings with his peers and organizes students in various roles to implement community and fundraising projects. Recently at our uh, prom 2.0, because we were uh, postponed a week, Zaid uh, was uh, voted on by his peers as our prom king. Ooh. You bet. Uh, Zaid's college and career path, and I claim Dibs Secondary Schools, is to uh, follow his passion of music and become a music teacher, uh, band director for high school students. Um, he has been a wonderful asset to our school, and he embeds everything that's responsible for our school. So Zaid, congratulations. Okay, next I'd like to ask uh, Mrs. Kathy Scott to come up to the mic. Good evening. So I'm very excited to introduce our character of trait selection is Mr. Ryan Hamilton. So uh, Ryan has been, uh, he is well deserving of this honor and I would like to tell you a little bit about him. Last school year, Ryan was assigned through his IEP to work in the main office three days a week to further develop his executive functioning skills. We were very excited for the opportunity to help Ryan, but we quickly learned Ryan would be helping us. Once Ryan understood all the expectations and procedures, he became the most trustworthy student we've ever had to ever help out in the office. And if the office staff to this day has v any important tasks to be completed, the ladies make sure to wait for the days that Ryan's on duty, which is three days a week, when he'll be working because they know he will be fully trusted to do exactly what he's supposed to do, when he's supposed to do it, and how he's supposed to do it. And the best part is Ryan does it always with such joy, positivity, and happiness. And we love Ryan Hamilton. So, thank you. This is Ryan's teacher, Ms. Hitchcock. Mom and Dad. Okay, next I would like to have Dr. David Martinez come up. Well, good evening, President Snell, Board of Trustees, Dr. Navarro, members of the Cabinet, and other distinguished guests. Our recipient, Alexander Johnson, uh, could not be here tonight. He's out of town. For those not familiar with early college, we wrapped up on May 31st, and like many of our seniors, uh, they took off on a trip, a well-deserved trip, in the summer before they start college. But uh, they do want to express their gratitude for Alex being chosen as the superintendent's character graduate honoree for the pillar of respect. And some words I want to say about Alex is that over the years at ECHS, his consideration towards others have not wavered with classmates and our staff. He firmly believes in accepting differences and others and practices tolerance of differing ideas, both in the classroom and his interactions with people in general. When you have a conversation with Alex, he consistently demonstrates the ability to be an active listener and generally cares about what other people have to express. He's a very balanced thinker and is easygoing and mild-mannered. It's actually his responses to his classmates. He does so in a very careful, uh, 
demeanor when we have Socratic seminars, debates. Uh, he wants to arrive at consensus and accept understanding after all voices have been heard and acknowledged. So Alex is also one of our Les Miller Outstanding Student Recipients. Uh, he is one of our valedictorian graduates, and he had a perfect 4.0 GPA. He was a member of the National Honor Society and part of AVID since 2016. Of his 250 credits that he earned at ECHS, 60 of those were in college courses through Coastline Community College. He plans to major in music industry studies because he is quite an accomplished musician on the guitar. If you ever see those fingers on the strings, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, but he is going to be going to Cal Poly Pomona. So I'd like to recognize Alex Johnson. I see that Dr. Bolton is back in the room. <laughs> Come on up, Dr. Bolton. President Snell, members of the board, Dr. Navarro, executive cabinet, and distinguished guests, thank you for having us here today. And our character award is going to Miranda McCormick for caring. Mm -hmm. And. And this is a uh, this is this account is told in first person, and it happened in Mrs. Caulfield's class. But it just kind of it evolved over the course of the school year in her IBHL2 class. It's an English class, but it gives you insight and it gives you a little window into the type of person Miranda is, and it's it's quite significant. I met Miranda last year in my IBHL Literature 1AB class. It was a strong class with many positive, skilled, and driven students. Miranda did not immediately stand out. However, I soon began to notice her incredible kindness and care to others. I had a student in the room with a mental disability, and while no one knew of her condition, Miranda seemed drawn to help her. She unobtrusively attended to many of her needs and would set up study sessions with her to help her through the class. I noted all of this, but Miranda never mentioned it to me nor anyone else that I knew. She had great talent in helping her, peer, her peers and others in the class, but it was never egotistical or seeking reward. It was simply a part of who she was. Mm -hmm. Quite frankly, her kindness, patience, and effectiveness as a tutor deeply impressed me. I was not surprised to later learn of Miranda's background of caring and for her tutoring younger dyslexic sister throughout her life. Miranda, that speaks volumes for who you are and why you were nominated. And we couldn't be prouder at Newport Harbor High School that you're representing our school with the Superintendent's Character Awards. Dr. Navarro, um, I, I thought it would be nice to give Emily a chance to get her picture with her parents sure. if they're here, because she we weren't doing that then. Emily, are you here? Did you? Well, yeah. we tried to get mom. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> no, <yeah. laughs> Sometimes we just <coughs> roll. Yeah, you know? sure. I look back and I'm not in Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so if uh, you didn't notice as you came in uh, to members of our audience, their banners are hanging already up in the lobby oh. and they'll be there for the entire year. Next year we'll invite them back to pick them up and keep them as a souvenir. But uh, these are 
you know, incredible students that really are symbols of the great things uh, that we have in our, in our student body. Uh, we have many, many students that could have been given this award. It's a difficult choice, but I tell you, these are great examples of what our, what our kids are like and, and the spirit that lives in them. Not just their brains, but the kind of people they are. And that's what's nice about this recognition. It's about who you are, not necessarily what you've accomplished, although who you are makes, means a lot when, mm -hmm. with what you, when, uh, when it comes to what you accomplish. So thank you very much, and I hope everybody makes sure to take a look at their banners as they're hanging out there. Oh, yeah. Great. Okay, since this is award season, we have some more awards to give out. Um, if um, the awards we just gave, if you would like to leave, feel free to go through the glass doors or go through there. <laughs> And um, the next awards, um, I am going to turn over to, who am I turning it over to? Uh, Dr. Bauermeister. <laughs> President Snell, members of the board, Dr. Navarro, cabinet, and distinguished guests, it's with great pleasure that we are recognizing two CIF championships this evening for the spring sports season. Both of these championship teams hail from Corona Del Mar High School. The first CAF Southern Section champion to be recognized is the Corona Del Mar Boys Volleyball Team. We all know how difficult it is to win a league championship, and to win a CIF crown certainly puts you in select company. The Corona Del Mar Boys Volleyball Team not only won a CIF Southern Section championship, but a Southern California Regional Championship and a National Championship. Wow. And by the impressive. way, the second ranked team in the United States is Newport Harbor High School. Oh. <laughs> so the number one and two ranked teams in the United States were both from Newport Mesa Unified School District. So with that, I'd like to ask Colonel Mar Principal Kathy Scott to the podium to introduce her coach and team. Mm. Looks like we'll have to introduce. Here she comes. Oh, here, she, here she comes. She's trying to get through the board. Trying to get through. <laughs> <laughs> Wavy. Look at just, you're a little minion over there. We were enjoying the banners. So. <laughs> Lots of recognize. Them. My, oh, okay, here we go. So, good evening, good President evening. Snell, board members, cabinet, and all of our guests tonight. Uh, this is very exciting for CDM. So, I'm not sure what we've introduced so far. Are we ready for volleyball? Yes. All right. They're all here. Look back there at them. So let me tell you a little bit about our boys' volleyball team. Uh, they finished this season with an overall record of 34-4, and four, finishing their league season as undefeated league champions. From uh, that point, we went, on to, we went on to win five straight tough CIF playoff matches, ending with a dramatic five-set victory over Newport Harbor. Is Dr. Bolton still here? Um, <laughs> to win the CIF Division I championship. Then we went... Uh, then we won three straight tournament matches, culminating with a victory over Newport Harbor to win the Division I Southern California Regional Championship. The result of these accomplishments is that our team is now ranked the number one team in the nation by Max Prep. And so at this time, I want to introduce to you our head coach, Steve Conti, so that he can introduce the players of our team. We're very proud of him. Thank you for having us in this evening and honoring uh, this wonderful boys team that we have. Um, it was a very, very special year just winning a CIF and state regional championship, but getting to play against your crosstown rival and the environment that both teams got to play in was truly unique. Um, we'll honor these boys. Nick Colacano. Brandon Browning. Austin Chandler. Adam Flood. Tyler Flood. Jaden Glenn. Brandon Hicks. <laughs> Kevin Cobran. <laughs> Kevin 
<laughs> Matt Olson. Patrick Paragas. Shane Simpson. And Patrick Wynn. Let's try to get two rows. The uh, really tall guys in the back. Just <laughs> 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 the really tall ones. The really tall ones. Uh, yeah, and the sort of tall guys in the back. I can totally see <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. This, this is. Insane. They know the routine. I need you to find Michelle. Sorry. Podium's in the way. You're okay. Okay, you ready? <laughs> One, two, three. You're good. You should. You're not tall enough. <laughs> <laughs> You're not tall enough. <laughs> <laughs> You're not tall enough. <laughs> Yeah. No, there's there's a couple of them that are telling to be taller. I want to know how many. Kids okay, are. congratulations. So uh, again, you can um, you can uh, move on, coach. <laughs> coach, coach, coach. How many are returning? Uh, we, ha we have six, re six returning. Oh, boy. Next year, huh? Graduating a lot of good seniors, but yeah, we, did, yeah. we did the same thing the previous year. So You got it. <laughs> the bar said hi. <laughs> oh, yeah, this was a surprise season, and it was a lot of fun. Mrs. Snell, can I just make a comment? Yes, sure. please. I just want to say I am a super fan of this team. And, I, I mean, if anybody has seen them play, the last two matches against Newport Harbor were amazing. And I know... We can only invite winner, winning teams, otherwise we'd be spending our whole me meeting time acknowledging teams that come in here, but it's really a shame that we could not have Newport Harbor yes, here as yes. well, because the two of those teams, you feel like you're not mm -hmm. watching a high school match. I mean, mm -hmm. it's really very high level, so congratulations to them. They okay. were... Really it was super. fun to watch. It's the best boys volleyball I've seen ever yeah. because it was so competitive. And, and yeah. I thank you, Ms. Chelsea, because it was truly two very competitive teams. Either team could have won and would have been well-deserved winners. So thank you for that. So also, I'd like to recognize, there they are. Um, our, they may be few, but they're very mighty. Our boys golf team, they finished nine and six overall, six and four in an extremely tough league for golf, uh, finishing in a three-way tie for second place despite averaging less than 39 strokes per player over nine holes for the season. Since we lost the league in a tiebreaker, we entered the South Coast Divisional Tournament as an at-large team. However, by shooting an overall team score of 374 for five players over 18 holes. Our average score for each player was under 75 at a tough Taliga golf course. Wow. This resulted in our team being the first ever at large team to win a CIF division championship. So at this time I'd like to bring up our head coach Mike Starkweather so that he can introduce each of our players on this team. We're very proud of them as well. Sure. This is Carlos Navaretti. He's my assistant coach. And <laughs> without him, it'd be impossible. <laughs> this is the goal, everybody. Oh, wow. This is the goal. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great. This is, uh, and the boys, this is the fifth one we've gotten since I've been coaching. And uh, a remarkable season. In 25 years of coaching this sport, um, to have a tie in a competition is virtually unheard of because you're throwing up a lot of scores. We had four ties this year broken by tiebreakers 
as difficult as it was down the line. Our league is so tough that, uh, as she mentioned, we were fourth place in our league, and uh, we went to CIF as a nut large. We had to petition to get in, and uh, the kids really performed well and did very, very well, um, hence competition. And the nice thing is they are all coming back next year. <laughs> I'd like to introduce you to Oscar Chang. <laughs> Guy Klaus. <laughs> You're going to hear of this guy. He, he uh, made it into the U.S. Open qualifier. Whoa. Oh, wow. <laughs> Colin, Ch Colin Huang. <laughs> He's new this year and has brought a lot to the team. Hey, Judge. You're welcome, buddy. Hey, Judge. Um, TJ Jenkins is not here tonight. He's, uh, unfortunately, he has a prior obligation. He was in a tournament in the desert in a nice 110 degree weather today. Mm. Uh, yeah. Will LeBeau is not here either. But Lawrence Shee. Sophomore, a good sized golfer, uh, and Ryan Shi. I want to thank all the parents that are here. Without them, it would be impossible, as you well know. There's such a commitment from the parents, uh, and the kids have done so well, and the school has really been helpful also. So thank you. Well, Coach, um, coming from a family who are avid golfers, and my husband was a scratch golfer at SC, as well as my brother-in-law, who also is a member of Augusta, so has had the pleasure of doing that. I can't tell you what a, an amazing accomplishment it is for you all to win this. Coming in from an at, at an at-large, congratulations. And since you're all being back, we're going to see you next year. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Oh. The plaque? <laughs> we could put it back here on the wall. <laughs> okay, so moving on um, to the final student board member reports and certificates. So we'll do the, re we'll do the reports first. So why don't we start with Max Johnson? Why don't we start with, <laughs> with Van? I don't know, whoever. Am I going? Yeah, you're already telling me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start with you. <laughs> Hi, my name is uh, Max Johnson. I'm giving a student board report for Corona Mar High School. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. First off, last night we had our academic awards night. Also, thanks to all the board members and other district members that were there. It's great to see you all. Um, and then this week we actually have two, it's like a double themed week. We have de-stress week for finals coming up next week and we also have rainbow week which is just supporting inclusion with all of our students. Um, we also last week hosted a unified Sea Kings sporting event which it, we played kickball uh, mm -hmm. that was hosted by the Special Olympics and we combined both special and general education students playing kickball with our softball and baseball players. Um, upcoming events that we have is Thursday, we ha this week, we have the Living History Veterans Project, where we have a lot of veterans come to our campus, and we're having an amazing luncheon. And then also next week um, <coughs> is we have our final week of school and finals week, so I know all the underclassmen are getting ready for that. And while the underclassmen are getting ready for that, all the seniors mm -hmm. on Monday have a, have a breakfast on campus, and then Tuesday we're going to Disneyland, and Wednesday we have a luncheon with some of the senior teachers and 
all of the seniors, and then Thursday we graduate. So that's Yay. it. Pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, and an amazing year representing CDM. Thank, Thank you, you so you much. Guys. You've been great. Okay, Lauren. Oh, sorry. Oh, that's right, because you're all here. Okay, Rachel. I can't see any more signs. Rachel. Yeah. Rachel. Good evening, board. I'm Rachel Krikorian, representing Costa Mesa High School. We are getting super excited for our graduating class of 2018, and we cannot wait to have our senior week. There's lots of things planned for them. Um, despite some minor setbacks due to the fire in the Aliso Laguna Canyon, we had our prom postponed to the following Saturday, which was a few days ago, the 9th, and it was absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. It was the same time, same place, just a different day. <laughs> we had a DJ as well as a live swing band outside, and they actually invited students to perform with them. It was really awesome. We had unlimited desserts and photo booth strips, as well as professional photos to purchase. We recently hosted our Mustangs Awards, where we recognized our top 12 students in each um, in each course, and so that was really fun. It was in the morning, and then we um, followed it with some breakfast. And then it's a Mesa tradition for each class cabinet to um, host a bonfire um, for their grade, so we're really looking forward to those, and our first one is this Saturday. It's a freshman. And lastly, our junior class is preparing for their senior takeover, where on the last <laughs> day of school, the juniors take over the senior quad, uh, and each student is charged $2 to get in um, with ASB and three without. And we really go all out. The night before, we deck out the whole quad in saran wrap, and the whole floor <laughs> is covered in balloons, and the whole side of the library is covered with a huge poster. Um, we get a live DJ. We're going to try to get the Kona ice uh, shave ice truck to come. Yeah. We're going to have uh, ping pong and cornhole and games all day and Polaroid pictures. And so we really can't wait. And I had such a joy presenting this year. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, who we have over there? Ah, hi. <laughs> Hello, good evening. My name's Andrea, I'm representing for Estancia. So we had our academic assembly last Tuesday to recognize students who improved their GPA, A3G eligibility for the UC's, USC's um, campus seniors, and then the participation from ASB, Link Crew, HOSA, and also Project Lead the Way. Um, <coughs> starting with the next week, we are taking our finals. Um, we also have senior act activities next week as well, including a pool party and also our senior brunch. Our graduation is on June 21st at 3 p.m. at Jim Scott Stadium. And that's pretty much it. I want to just thank you guys for having me here as a student representative. Thank, thank you. you. Hello. Hi. Good evening, everyone. You need to get happy. <laughs> I try. Um, I'm Jalen. I'm from Newport Harbor. So most recently, we had our prom rally and our prom at the Yost Theater. We had a successful Grit Cycle event benefiting the Newport Harbor Education Foundation. Our Bridges program honored four of our teachers on campus who they felt positively influenced them and impacted our campus. We had our 57th annual Newport Beach Chamber of Commerce Athletes of the Year dinner. Our senior award ceremony is this upcoming week. And at the OC Hum Human Relations Award Ceremony, one of our teachers was awarded the Outstanding Bridges School Award. Mm -hmm. Our senior dinner is this next Tuesday, and we're also entering finals week. And then, of course, our class of 2018 is graduating on Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> now, does the t-shirt have any significance that you're yeah, wearing? Yeah, I'm going to Texas A&M. Okay. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you so much for having Thank me. Thank you. You're a delight. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Now we have um, Van. Van. Oh. No. 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 <laughs> we made him wait. We made him wait. We made him wait. I, I just, I, yeah. She decided I was going last. She decided. I'm just feeling kind of frisky tonight, so I made him wait. <laughs> Might as well, right? Yeah. So last night, what can you lose? I know. Anyway, my name is Van Fine, representing Back Bay Monta Vista. It's been a great time, a wild ride. Uh, got a couple short little things to talk about today. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, end of the year stuff. We don't have finals, so that's always fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, our school awards night last Thursday went very well. Over $100,000 in scholarships were given out to our students. Wonderful. Uh, I'm told that the food was pretty good as well. Mm -hmm. 
Our okay. guest speaker series has continued as we recently welcomed Crystal Sanchez of the OCDE Safe from the Start program. Mm -hmm. The OC Safe from the Start vision is to empower individuals, families, organizations, and communities to reduce children's exposure to violence and reinforce the belief that every Orange County child is my concern. Mm. Between Back Bay and Monta Vista this year, we have already had 57 students complete necessary graduation requirements and have started college or joined the workforce as high school graduates. On June 21st, we anticipate another 30 more graduates joining us for our graduation celebration at St. Andrew's Church in Newport Beach. Uh, also, I want to talk about prom. Mm -hmm. It was really, really cool what they did. They got five continuation schools in the area to come together to do a continuation school prom. It was mm -hmm. casino night themed. They had blackjack. They had roulette. It was a whole lot of fun. Mm -hmm. It was a really great idea, and I hope they do something like that again next year, but maybe even bigger. <laughs> great. Uh, I just want to say I really appreciate all the support you guys have given me as board member this year. Uh, I've learned a lot. I've, uh, I hope I've given something back, maybe mm -hmm. a little bit. And uh, I, I just really want to thank you guys. It's, it's been great. Thank, thank you. you. It's thank been you. great. Yeah. I think we all can agree that we've had a great group of board, student board members this year. And we want to thank each and every one of you. We have some certificates, so I'll call you up again. Mm -hmm. But um, it's really been a remarkable year. And to the seniors, good luck mm -hmm. with whatever college, activity, whatever you're doing, and with those who are returning, we may see you here, but I'm sure we'll see you on campus if we don't. So thank you, and I'll call you guys up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe you should stay up here, yeah. Step for follow-up. Yeah, good. <laughs> All about the photos. Yeah. Lauren Griffin. <laughs> Rachel Victoria. Aaron Wynn. <laughs> and Alexander Leon and Lucy Dietrich from Early College are going to read the report. No, they're not here. They graduated already. <laughs> <laughs> they're finished. And Melody also has graduated from Back Bay. Okay. Can I get you guys in two rows? And sorry, you get the B team with an iPhone. <laughs> 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 Nothing better than parent paparazzi. I know. <laughs> okay, thank you. We're going to miss you, some of you. Yeah. I mean, I all of mean you. That all way. of you. I mean, some of you will be gone. So. <laughs> That's what I meant. No, I know. I know it's a lot to come here uh, twice a month, and um, <laughs> we know. And I understand. So we really appreciate hearing about your schools, and it's, so it's been great to get to know, get to know you, and have you participate in, in local government. What do you think? <laughs> They're all just wishing to go into politics and yes. do all this. Yep, yes. exactly. Okay. Yeah. 
So now we have the final uh, Harbor Council PTA report with Cynthia Strassman. Good evening, Hi. President Snell, Dr. Navarro, board, cabinet, community members, and spirit, or student leaders. I guess I could, <laughs> you're spirited. <so. laughs> yeah, there you go. I just have a couple things to share. Um, we did have our last council meeting last week, and what we did differently for this particular meeting was not only did we, you know, the current PTA presidents attended, but we invited their newly elected executive board members to attend. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to take that opportunity to welcome them into the council. Sometimes new PTA leaders are kind of um, I don't want to say hesitant, but they're kind of, you know, what's this Harbor Council all about? So we wanted to just um, set the tone that we're warm, inclusive, we're friendly, and that we're here to partner with them and to ensure their success as leaders. And we did take that opportunity as well to provide a PTA leadership in service uh, during this meeting. Mm -hmm. um, happy to report we had about 75 in attendance. So that was well well attended and well received. So we will be continuing on uh, doing that again next year. Uh, secondly, um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Navarro and District for partnering with Harbor Council. Uh, we met Vicki Waldo, our president, and I met with Dr. Navarro earlier this year, and we discussed the, the possibility of having parrot ed forums next year um, to address some of issues of um, that you know our families and students are facing, given some you know situations that we've had to endure this year. And through that meeting and collaboration with the district, we also reached out to parent representatives in each of those zones, the high schools, middle, and elementary schools. They all met two weeks ago, and through that meeting, there was a sharing of ideas and uh, issues that are unique to their uh, zones, their areas, and we're um, in the development stage of the calendar and parent ed forms for next year. So stay tuned, more information will be forthcoming in August, September. Dr. Navarro, okay. So more on that later. Mm -hmm. And lastly, uh, what's moving ahead for what's to come with Harbor Council? We have a planning session in August, and um, we'll be identifying our goals for the next year, hopefully to include continued PTA leadership um, development and membership recruitment and retention. Um, one idea to leave you all with, we may have a healthy student high school membership challenge at Battle of the Bays that's oh. uh, been tossed around between Newport Harbor and Corinda Mar. Mm -hmm. um, it's all in the talking phase at this time, so we mm -hmm. will share later. Mm -hmm. It's been a fantastic year. We've had a lot of growth within our council, a lot of great things that have come from that. We have some great leaders in our units, and we're excited for what the new year will lend us. Exactly. So thank you. Thank you so much. So, student board members, if you would like to take your leave, you may. Or you can stick around for the reports. We have like. You can take your nameplates. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Those are yours. Wear them proudly tomorrow at school. No. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so moving on to reports. Um, uh, the first 14A is a financial report from the Citizens Oversight Committee regarding Measure F expenditures. So I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Mr. Trader. Or it says, oh, Mr. Holcomb. Oh, is he? Oh, he's back there. Yep, he's <laughs> here. He's hiding. He's here. He's hiding. Must be, yeah. must be Mr. Holcomb. <laughs> Mr. Holcomb. Yes. Um, um, we're very happy tonight to have the chairman of the Citizens Oversight Committee here to present a report to you on the uh, financial expenditures and the performance of the um, Measure F bond funds. As you know, uh, we're coming to the end of the bond program and there was a short period of time where uh, the district had a hard time getting an oversight committee together, but we've had uh, a really great group of uh, community members who have been meeting regularly and uh, they're here to give you their first report as a new committee. And here's Mr. Vance. Okay. Hi. Uh, good evening, President Snell and Dr. Navarro and members of the board. Uh, my name is Mitch Vance and it's a real privilege to serve as the chairman this year of the Measure F Citizens Oversight Committee uh, on behalf of all of our seven members. Um, I'd like to start by just quickly reviewing and reminding everyone uh, why I'm here and representing the committee. Uh, in 2005, the committee was established by the school board for the primary purpose of ensuring that 
uh, our tax, ensuring our taxpayers that the expenditures from uh, the bond funds are consistently uh, consistent with the stated purposes in Measure F. In other words, that um, our job is to confirm that the school district is using the bond funds in the way that we promised our taxpayers. Our members are appointed by the school board uh, and they represent a broad range of constituency groups in the community. And our committee will serve uh, until the last dollar of Measure F bond funds are spent. Uh, we perform our charter uh, or duty by meeting about four times a year uh, with the senior management of the district and as necessary the architects, builders, and independent auditors. Uh, during these meetings, they present a detailed update of the planning, scheduling, budgeting, and expenditures on all the Measure F funded projects. And then we probe and we sometimes prod uh, them with <laughs> lots of questions and issues, sometimes for hours. <laughs> and they graciously and patiently answer our questions and often provide additional data for us to review until all of our members of the committee are satisfied that we are doing our job on behalf of you and the taxpayers. Also annually during one of our fall meetings, we also interview the independent auditor firm who does two things. They audit the financials of the Measure F building fund, which contains the bond proceeds, and they complete a performance audit, which ensures that the expenditures are complying with the relevant sections of the California Constitution as well as the provisions of Measure F. So, on behalf of our committee, I'm pleased to report that for the most recent two fiscal years, ending June 30, 2017 and 16, our independent auditor has given the district's Measure F Building Fund financial statements an unqualified opinion, which means a clean bill of health, both for the financial and performance audits. Our committee has also periodically reviewed all the expenditures from the Measure F funds, including focusing on the expenditures related to the Davidson Field renovation, which comprises the vast majority of funding from Measure F over the past couple of years. And we feel the Davidson Field renovation is an outstanding example of design and construction, but it was expensive, and we wanted to better understand the almost 16.1 million that was spent on the project. After considerable review of documents, lots of Q&A with district executives and managers, our committee members are very satisfied with the expenditures, and we believe they are in keeping with the requirements of Measure F as approved by the taxpayers. I'd also like to mention that we found Tim Holcomb, Tim Marsh, Jeff Trader, and all the other district managers and staff we interacted with to be approachable, responsive, and notwithstanding our often very annoying probing styles, <laughs> patient during our review process, and we commend them for the job they are doing in measuring and managing the Measure F projects. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that ends my report, and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, do we have any questions? So, you're staying on for the next project, this committee, our, our theater project. Yes, our yes. committee will serve until all of the Measure F funds are, okay. are spent. Okay. Yes, they, they have terms uh, uh -huh. that they were appointed to, uh -huh. and then, <coughs> pardon me, as those terms uh, come up, we will reapproach the board uh, with uh, continuing per the bylaws or uh, appointing new members to the committee. But uh, with your uh, change to the bylaws of the committee to allow it to be seven members, uh, versus the old uh, number of 31, it's much easier to, uh, at, at this late stage in the bond program, to obtain the interest uh, from members. And uh, we really, uh, I've, I've said this at every single meeting, and it is absolutely true, uh, the, the, the folks who have been showing up have, have just been doing a fantastic job. And, um, you know, it's not as exciting in the bond campaign now <laughs> as it is. Uh, at the very beginning. <laughs> so it really is a commitment to the community shown mm -hmm. by these members, and uh, they have done a great job on behalf of the taxpayers. Absolutely. Well, they'll get, a, they'll get a good flavor of the whole thing with the, with theater, the theater, with the theater. They'll start to finish on that one. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you, Mr. Thank you. Vance, and please pass on our thanks to the committee members for, I, serving, yeah. for your service. We I will appreciate do that. it. Thank you. It's been a privilege. Thank you. Okay. Clap. Yay. Moving on to 14B, facilities, facilities update on the HVAC. 
project <coughs> in front of Del Mar Excuse High me. School sports field. And back to Mr. Yes. Holcomb. Thank you, Mrs. Snell. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as you know, we, we have a lot of projects uh, getting going in the facilities department mm -hmm. and uh, specifically wanted to update you this evening on uh, our HVAC projects. We have six different schools that will be getting air conditioning this summer mm -hmm. uh, and then there will be a whole series again next summer. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to the schools that are being air conditioned, uh, we have a school that is having its uh, administration area changed actually a couple one changed with the HVAC project one changed separate from that and uh, the CDM sports field project has begun and so uh, Ms. Zarasny will be giving a report on that this evening okay good good evening. yay <laughs> it's up <laughs> board members uh, Dr. Navarro and cabinet have a few of us left here. Um, so I'm gonna try to make this very brief. I know that you have a long evening ahead, so I'm gonna go through it quickly. If you have any questions at the end, I'd be happy to answer them. So we are going to just focus on um, the air conditioning projects primarily, and then give you an update of the CDM um, sports fields project mm -hmm. and the schedule that we're working towards. So uh, we packaged the projects, the summer projects, in a particular order and arrangement based on the location of the schools themselves. We also had input from contractors as to how many projects that they would be capable of bidding. So we've structured these projects um, into four different bids, and you'll kind of see how, that, how that's done. Um, the first project is the air conditioning projects at College Park, Davis, and Pomona. Um, we have awarded that contract. We'll be ratifying that contract with you here shortly. Uh, when we go out to bid, we ask you for permission to advertise an award, and we always come back to you to ratify the contractor. So this particular contractor uh, is Scorpio. They also go by Air Masters. And this number that you see here, the total project cost, is construction, design, DSA. Um, it's everything, uh, including all the soft costs. Um, and then one thing I wanted to point out is the costs for the projects, four of the six air conditioning projects, are significantly more because we went through a second design phase. So when we had the original projects designed, they were already designed, DSA approved, and we were ready to go. So when we went from the roof mounted to the ground mounted, we essentially had to redesign everything and pay DSA for everything again. So mm -hmm. it, they're, they're more expensive than our traditional projects. And that only includes, excuse me, that only includes College Park, Davis, Pomona, and Wilson. Kaiser and Woodland, we had already made the decision to um, have ground mounted. Got it. So that's this current project, which we call it HVAC Project A. Um, we have the contractor on board for that. Um, the second project is HVAC projects at Kaiser and Woodland. And even though it's two schools and it's a total project cost of you know close to 7.5 million, um, this, this project is more expensive because what, uh, Kaisler is essentially a middle school. Mm -hmm. So the square footage that we're putting air conditioning is, it's probably you know twice as much as an elementary school, so the cost is a little bit more high, it's higher. And uh, the contractor for this project is at Los Angeles Air. They, um, so both for both of the bids, the air conditioning contractors have performed for us before. So LA Air did our last round of projects they were very successful. The first group we know was a little bit difficult because we had the, the flash flood. Yeah, We could have done better at protecting um, mm -hmm. the roofs. We know mm -hmm. better now, mm -hmm. not ever gonna happen again. Um, so I just included this so that you're, you're familiar with how we're packaging our projects. Um, mm -hmm. we're, this project here is for the admin fencing, the security fencing at Mariners and Newport Heights. They're close to each other, we package them together. The inspector who's working on this project is also um, the inspector that is redoing the, um, the gym at Ensign. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's serving on, on all three of these projects. He was also the inspector at Newport Harbor High School for the Davidson Field. Mm -hmm. So all familiar faces. Mm -hmm. um, the, this contractor, JRH, I have not worked with in the past. They came recommended, they passed all of our pre-qualification requirements, so we're happy with them um, coming in and bidding our project. 
The last project is the um, Wilson project, and Wilson is comprised, Wilson's the lucky school here. They get office fencing and air conditioning in one year. Wow. So they, they get it all without phasing it, um, but we've packaged that one together because it is the entire school air conditioning plus the other um, scope, we bid it as one project. And that contractor is NKS Construction, and again, they passed our pre-qualification process. So what are they gonna look like? So we, since we went to ground mounted, um, we know that you know, these are gonna be visible to some degree. Uh, the units themselves, I've personally stood next to these units on the roof of a, um, our engineer's office. They are, um, they're not loud. They end up being white noise. Um, so it's not gonna be disruptive to the classroom. They have grills on them to make sure that any fan coils are not exposed, that the kids can't stick their fingers in there or get hurt. So we've, we've taken those things into consideration. Um, for the summer projects themselves, we are not doing any sort of enclosures, any fencing or enclosures. The, the, the intent is to do screening of some sort. So this is a particular material or plant material that MNO likes to use. Um, the picture, so the picture on the left is my old house. <laughs> and I was trying to cover a block wall, which you can't see the block wall. Um, and then the other picture on the right is Corona Del Mar High School. And there are a ton of conduit banks behind that silver sheen. So it's not very dense. It looks pretty, it moves in the wind, um, and it doesn't drop very many leaves. So maintenance, it's not a big maintenance issue. So that's all I had on air conditioning. Um, Corona Del Mar High School Sports Field. We are, as you know, you guys authorized us to move ahead with LPA for design of the two fields. Um, so we have, since we've seen you last, have gone through several meetings with the school site to talk about <coughs> what are what exactly are there little things that need to be changed in the project? What are those things? How can we accommodate that? Uh, really, there was striping what field is gonna have dots for, for lacrosse and what one's gonna have permanent striping. It wasn't anything you know, too significant. We um, confirmed uh, dimensions of the fields with the coaches. Um, so pretty much, not much has changed. Some fence opening locations mm -hmm. and um, otherwise we end up with our two fields. The main field with the track field is going to be lined for um, football, soccer, and lacrosse. And then the secondary field is going to have um, the markings for soccer and lacrosse primarily. And then we're just simply putting hatching on the lines, on the ends of the lines for football. Football didn't want full lines, they didn't want full numbers, they just wanted the hatching. So mm -hmm. we're able to accommodate that. Um, the only other thing that was significant that was requested from the site was to put taller fencing around the shot put area. So yes. we typically would have six feet or four feet at the track. We're doing 10 feet enclosure around that area. That was just a safety concern. So we were able to get that into the design. Oh, let's see here. Is that, the, you mean the fence between the football area? So the, over uh, here oh. where the discus is? Yeah. yeah. There's gonna end up being fencing along here that's 10 feet, mm. go up to the trees off of Vista del Oro, mm -hmm. back towards the track, and then kind of this, this uh, U shape back over to the other fence. And that's all 10 foot? Yes. And, but the rest of the fencing so is not? So perimeter yeah. fencing mm -hmm. for the facilities themselves is 10 foot with the mm -hmm. one inch link, the mesh that we've been doing mm. at all the other schools. There is a four foot um, fence that goes around the track to keep spectators off the track. Mm. There'll be little gates, little like mm. three foot gates that you mm -hmm. can go in and open if you want to, but it's primarily to keep everybody off the track during an event. Mm -hmm. But there'll be access points. Kind of like Estancia is that way. Yep. It has yep. those. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And so is um, Mesa. Mesa. Yeah. Okay, so where are we in the schedule? Um, we mm. are, we have approved that drawing that you were just looking at is considered 
considered schematic design where they verify everything fits, they get all the particulars of what we've asked them to do. The next phase is design development where they're really looking at um, the elevations and how can we get ADA accessibility to the particular area? Do we have to have infill? Are we removing soil? You know, what are all those different particulars? Um, so we've authorized LPA to move forward. We had a kickoff meeting on May 14th. And then these are just all the other phases. Um, district review of design development, us, app us approving that design development, and then kicking off the construction um, document phase, which is where all the details come into play. That ends up being the set of documents that gets submitted to DSA. But we'll have an incremental review at 50%, so we expect in um, September that we would be reviewing those documents. and. Um, because we are moving towards having uh, a project management firm come in and assist, we'll be better suited for reviewing those documents. Um, and then we anticipate on submitting to DSA in November. And, um, you know, DSA has been really good. They have really uh, met timelines, you know, pretty efficiently. So we don't get to blame them too much for, for lagging anymore. Mm -hmm. they're, they're really stepping up to the plate and with electronic design review, um, it's just, it's sped things up tremendously. So we expect to start construction June 1st of 2019. Okay. Chugga, chugga, chugga. And then this, this, <laughs> I know, yeah. this plan is just showing you other elements that we're trying to improve. The purple clouded area is just the pathways that we're going to make sure that we have lit from the back parking lot mm -hmm. to encourage ah. that, that, um, that thoroughfare. So people are really parking in our parking lots. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the blue uh, circle is just we're doing soil boring. So where we go 30 feet deep when we see how quickly the water uh, drains. So we can know how, what kind of soil conditions we're dealing with. So that's some outstanding items, and that's all I had. Thank you. That is great. Yeah. That is great. We have a couple questions here, okay. but that that is that's wonderful. It's we're moving forward. Yep. Yes, Miss Flora. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, I was able to participate in the meeting on the 14th. Then, uh, or could you talk to the um, to the board about the process by which we're keeping everybody off the streets and out of our parking lots, the construction. When we start construction, there was a lot of concern about making sure that they're not taking our parking parking slots mm -hmm. and where are they parking and the offloading and so, and then um, talking about the exterior fencing and where the entrances are going to be for that secondary field. So when we bid the project, we will identify an area for the contractor for his lay down area. Um, and so likely what's going to happen is we're going to let them take use of this area here since um, it's really, it's part of the project. We're not making improvements to that area, but it's going to be the access. So they're going to come off of Vista del Oro and they're going to come in <coughs> with the road that we used to build the theater and the enclave off that, um, that same location. So we're expecting we would give them a, a pretty large chunk here so that they could have all their construction vehicles um, on site or we're going to encourage them to park somewhere else. Park at South Coast Plaza, park somewhere else and in um, carpool in. The city was concerned with that, and we told the city that we would, you know, communicate with them. We'll also communicate with the church and the school to let them know when our construction is happening, um, which we've done every time we've done a project there. Uh, and so uh, the meeting that we had, that I, I missed that piece, the meeting that we had um, last week mm -hmm. was um, with the <coughs> CDM working group committee. So you made a commitment to, to our, in our communication policy to make sure that we're keeping them involved. So we actually presented this plan to them and a few of them are here, I'm sure they can speak to it. Really, I had no action item out of that meeting. Mm. So it went well. That's good. <laughs> I was like, I didn't get anything to do. So it went very well. I appreciate them participating um, and, you know, making sure that we're, we're presenting and building what we said we were building. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Good. We have no action items either. Yay! <laughs> we're doing something Thank you. right. I, I, I do have a question oh. about Newport Heights, and that's only, are, uh, what's happening with the... I can speak to that. The Newport, the... City. 
the city and yes. that horrible island that is in the middle that you have to having hang a U-turn to get even into the parking lot. So Are the we working city with that? just completed their review, their study. Okay. Um, it's online now. Uh, when we had our meeting last week, Tony Bryan from Public Works was here. And so he gave Tim Marsh and I a link to it. So we're gonna go review that. Once we review their study, then we can move forward with the parking lot redesign at Newport Heights. So I haven't, I haven't okay. analyzed it yet. They've just completed it and posted it. Um, they, it took them longer because they were supposed to complete it in March. It took them yeah. longer because some of the residents were upset that their area wasn't included in the study. So they had to go back and expand the study. <laughs> so they got so far along down and then they said, well, why not our area? So they went back and, and they expanded mm -hmm. the study area. Okay. Okay. We're good. Good. Yes, okay. we would. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Okay, moving on. Um, report on the local control and accountability plan and the 2018-19 budget. Mr. Trader, do we start with you? No, we oh, start with Mrs. Gailey. Okay. The Gailey Foundation. The Gailey Foundation. <laughs> okay. Good for you. Pretty good. It looks like John Drake is taking over again. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Oh, let's make sure. Okay. Okay. I know. The moment you've all been waiting for, I've said it again, but I mean it this time oh, is I true. Uh, tonight, we are presenting jointly, the first time ever. Um, uh, Mr. Trader and I decided that we really wanted to um, demonstrate how closely aligned the local control accountability plan and the budget are. We've worked hand in hand for years now, but um, especially since January, really trying to make sure that um, all of our um, actions and services and dollars are in alignment. And um, I think you can tell that um, we're really in alignment. I was gonna say. Thank you. Did you Thank plan you. that. No, he chose that exquisite shade of pink. <laughs> so, um, but we're going to get started and we're really thrilled. Um, President Snell and Superintendent Navarro and members of the, um, the board and cabinet and guests. Um, we have a 302 page document to present <laughs> to you this evening. Um, we're very proud of it. And uh, we, we're not gonna read every page to you, but we wanna make sure we provide some context for you around this plan. Oh, darn. And then also dig into some of the components and then show you where you can find it. And some of the support documents documents that we've provided. So what is the LCAP? It's the Local Control and Accountability Plan. It's a three-year plan, and it's a requirement of all districts in the state. And what it does is explain our goals for all students, as well as the outcomes we expect to see, and then the actions and services designed to meet those state priorities, um, with a particular emphasis on supporting students in the, quote, unduplicated count. And so what does that mean? Well. In most districts, there's certain funding that comes through for the, um, the schools um, and the, the district as a whole. And that funding, what we call our general fund, is called base funding, and it's based on the number of students in the district, all of them. And then most districts also get some supplemental funding, and that's additional funding based on the number of students who are part of specific groups, English learners, low-income students, foster youth, and homeless. And for the dollars, what they do is they use an unduplicated count. And what that means is that each student only counts one time, even if that student might be re represented in all four of those groups. So that unduplicated count is then used to generate base funds as well as supplemental funds for each of the students in this group. Now what's different for our district is we're a community funded or basic aid district, so we don't get these additional funds. However, we are held to the same expectations in terms of how we're going to support expenditures for all of our students, and in particular, the neediest students just mentioned. And our plan has to address eight state priorities, and those are listed here. And our plan does address eight of the, all of the priorities, even though, and we do have eight goals, but we don't have one goal per priority. Some of the priorities are put together in certain goals. Um, because we have an eighth goal for our signature academies and that's not listed here. But 
we are definitely covering all of the state priorities. <laughs> So our goals don't change for the three years, and um, we uh, really uh, tightened those up a couple of years ago. You may remember that at one point we had over 28 goals, mm -hmm. and we consolidated them into eight common sense goals. And so those are the ones you see before you. And the last major change we had was with goal one. In the original LCAP, we had English language arts as a standalone goal, but we updated it to include English language development in recognition of the state framework, um, talking about how we are supposed to provide English language arts and English language development element in tandem, side by side. So each of our goals addresses the content areas in goals one, two, and three. The broad course of study you see includes a number of different content areas. So goal four is about school climate and student engagement. Goal five is about parent involvement. Um, number six is basic services, which was really designed to address the Williams requirements of instructional materials, appropriately assigned <coughs> teachers, and facilities. We've also added some components this year around safety. We felt like that was the right place to put it, and we felt like this was the right time to make those additions. Also about college and career readiness, we wanna prepare all of our students to be successful in whatever they choose, both college and career. And then finally, our goal that's unique to our district around sim, um, signature academies. So the LCAP template is prescribed to us by the state and it has um, certain requirements. You can see them outlined here in the different colors and I've also included the page numbers. Um, the plan summary is the parent friendly summary of the plan and I say parent friendly summary in loose terms. It's, it has certain requirements that come from the state and um, of course we certainly would like for it to be shorter than it is but there are certain things that we must address. So we try to use as parent friendly language as possible. We also wherever possible um, define every acronym. So in Instead of just using letters like ELA or ELD, we will spell out English language arts and English language development. We also include a 2017-18 annual update. Those are required in the LCAP. And that is an update on our goals and the actions and, and services, the outcomes and expenditures. So you see columns that say we said we would do this, and then here is what happened. And then we said we would spend this dollar amount, and to the best of our knowledge right now, here is what happened. Because you'll also notice it's about estimated actuals. We haven't closed the book on this year, and we've been working on the annual update since January. <laughs> so we really try and, and keep an eye on the expenditure and at this point, some things we know and they've been expended and are out the door and other things we're still working on saying our, when, you know, when will the, the books close. We also describe our stakeholder engagement. We describe who gave input, how and when. And uh, we've had a number of different committees from schools, um, different groups, stakeholder groups weigh in, our district English learner advisory committee, um, our superintendent's parent advisory committee, those two are required. Um, but we have pages of, um, of the dates and locations that those uh, meetings took place. And then you'll see in the green, we have the three years of goals, um, sorry, actions and services, 17, 18, 18, 19, and 19, 20. And um, that again includes the expected outcomes, our actions, services, and budgeted expenditures. Um, what's different in this current LCAP, uh, they made a change to last LCAP. It used to be a rolling three year plan coming forward. And now we've preserved 1718, and then we have 1819 and 1920 where we can make additions and changes. Lastly, a description of increased or improved services. That's the place where most districts who get the extra money, and us too, because we set aside those funds, we explain all the things that we targeted toward those efforts and, um, and what, how it really is an increased or improved service. You don't necessarily need to buy more. It may be that you're improving what you're doing. And so often um, we'll describe that. And you'll also notice that we had to retain last year's essay. So they'll look very similar because many of the things we're doing, we are continuing. You don't change every single thing you do from year to year. So for the annual update, uh, one of the big questions you have is, well, where is the data? And you can find the data in a number of ways, but if you go to our district website and you look for the California School Dashboard, you can find a link there. Anyone can also find the dashboard on the California Department of Education website. The California School Dashboard looks like that, and in the fall, you'll see us come back again and we'll provide a report on the newly released dashboard. Um, because even though we have to present the LCAP now, they don't release the new dashboard until the fall. <laughs> That's just the way. Yeah. So um, one of the things about the dashboard is that it is um, color-coded pies, and then the pies also are a certain um, amount of fullness, so that even if you are not able to see color, you can see how full the pie is. And so what you're always hoping for is to be in green or blue, yellow is the mid-range, and in orange or red, those are the lower levels of performance, and anything that's in orange and red, you have to address in your LCAP. Now, you don't see any orange and red here, but if you were to click on some of those links and 
drill down, you may see specific um, student groups that may be in orange and red. And so we also address that in our LCAP. Now some of the things that you need to know about the student groups, and of course we care about every single student group, but one of the requirements around the, the subgroup size is depending on the metric, they may be looking to as few as 30 students. So you could see that with a very small group, if you have a, sm a small fluctuation in the number of students who are enrolled or um, who leave, especially with suspension, as is the case with us, then um, you can see a big, um, a big fluctuation. So stakeholder input. We, um, we, we, we do all of the, the required stakeholder input and then we continue to reach out to even more. So we met with um, CTA, um, or sorry, um, CSEA uh, in March and we met with NMFT. We um, also meet with our uh, school site leaders. There are different staffs that have weighed in and um, classified staffs, the Community Advisory Committee, which is our special ed representatives, our DLAC, our District English Learner Advisory Committee, our English Learner Advisory Committees and a number of schools participated. The LCAP survey was available from February to March, and so that was available for students, parents, and um, uh, I'll get to the uh, LCAP survey in a bit, NMFT in April. We had PTAs and PFOs participate, school site councils. We really tried to make an effort to get more student voice this year, site leadership teams, staff, student advisory committee, ASB. So um, we wanted to make sure that we really continue to do this robust outreach and always looking for more student voice in particular. Uh, the stakeholder input forms we redesign each year, um, but really what we focused on this year was just telling us about your reality. In years past, we asked them to act, we asked them to respond to different goals. This year, we just said, "Tell us what are some of the strengths and what are some of the challenges." And so we used more of that open-ended forum um, to to see what we were noticing from the schools. The February um, through March uh, survey was also conducted through a new vendor this year, and that was through Hanover Research. We're very, very pleased with them. Not that we weren't um, pleased with our prior survey support. We um, just had seen the reports um, that Hanover has produced for other districts, and we really felt like that kind of report was what we were looking for. Um, and this report is posted to the website. That's the survey analysis, and what they were able to do was look at our survey responses over three years, and then help us redesign some of the questions and then um, launch our survey uh, online. I will let you know that through the findings, um, one of the things we've learned is that we want to have our survey earlier in the year and we want to have it at a set time so everybody knows when it's going to be and to prepare because it's only online. And that will be January of next year. So the day we get back from winter break, well ahead of the testing time, it'll be a chance for us to increase our student responses and for us to also make sure that everybody knows about um, the survey. So for survey participation, uh, you'll notice that um, we went from very right-hand side, 1516, we had 3,581 total responses. 1617, we had 5,452 total responses. And in 1718, we had 7,334. So again, um, the survey window will adjust and we'll have more time to make sure everybody knows about it. And while we are very happy with the increase, it's, it's a large increase in participation, um, we're not satisfied. We definitely want more student response. We have about 10,000 students who could have responded, so we really wanna see us closer to that target number. And of course, we always want more parent and guardian response. So um, we'll be working again with our PTAs and our PFOs and with DLAC to make sure that everyone understands the survey's open and how to take it, and also making sure that the sites are equipped to support families who may need additional assistance with online access. So where can you find the LCAP? Well, if you go to the Newport Mesa webpage and you just put in the letters LCAP, you'll get to my page. <laughs> and, um, and it has some very generic explanation about the LCAP. And um, at the top, we've left questions and additional input and the, uh, the email address that anyone can, can email to. And then we have some resources that we think are really strong from PTA in both English and Spanish. And then additionally, this is a small shot, but it shows you the whole um, page. Underneath the LCAP resources down below, you have all of the 2018-19 LCAP documents, the current draft, and then some additional shortened documents in English and Spanish that will show you at a glance the things that we are, uh, we are doing in our actions and services. And then um, below that, you have our 1718 documents, so, so you, you can see what we did prior year. And then below that, you have the previous versions of all of the LCAPs, so you can go back in time and see what we started with. 
So uh, last year, I, I, as, as my LCAP grew and grew, I learned that um, it was really difficult for people to follow along in the multi-page document. So we created a shortened document. So the 1718 document is uh, four pages with all eight goals, and we really tried to um, stick to my boss's mantra of creating a one-pager, but there's absolutely no way I could make a one-pager on this. <laughs> so did the best we could. Not with font we could read. No, it was, yeah. it's a lot. Um, so the 1819 LCAP, uh, we, we made it look a little different, different font and different color, but still the same layout. And the, the basic thing I would like for people to know about this is that we we maintained so many actions and services. If there was no change, then you'll see the, the type in regular font. If there was an adjustment of some kind, we created a, just italics. So it would show that something was modified. And then um, the asterisk represents something that is partly or wholly funded through our our LCFF reservation, the money we set aside to um, for, for LCFF purposes. So I'm not going to read every single thing that we're doing to you, but it, and it is it is a lot. But we're just very proud of some of the things that we have done on behalf of all of our students, and especially our students who have the greatest need. And some of the things we're particularly proud of are the purchases and the adoption processes we've implemented in materials, English language arts, English language development. You'll see later in math, and I know there's a presentation later today, as well as the ongoing support we're providing with personnel, additional resources on campuses, and um, additional of some much needed um, professional development. Some of the um, parent survey uh, responses in the community survey let us know that um, there was really a need for more support in the area of English language development and language um, in general. So uh, we, we learned through experience this year at the elementary level, our Moonlight series for math was particularly successful and we want to replicate that in English language arts and English language development. The other thing I want to call your attention to down below for the all grade levels, you recently had a presentation um, from our special ed friends about the work that they're doing with inclusive practices and we wanted to make sure that we highlighted that you don't see our students with disabilities called out very often or excuse me our students with IEPs um, but we we really wanted to make sure that you you all know that our kids are alongside their general education peers and that is how we're supporting our students and we're providing additional resources where needed so you will see that throughout all of the different content areas it's a it's a large emphasis uh, for us same thing for um, science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, we are uh, continuing to um, move along with the adoptions and to uh, also to provide uh, extra access to our Summer Engineering Academy. Um, we're really proud of that enrichment opportunity in the summer. And last year, we were able to expand um, the transportation as well as the size of the program. We wanted to make sure that students from all far um, reaches of our district could, could go there. And then in secondary, you'll see a lot of the additions around um, our math adoptions and and some additional components of um, math performance tasks. And then uh, our teachers on special assignment, as well as some coaches, um, we're still going to continue having that, but we're also going to arm them with additional support on focusing on English learners. So um, we're going to maintain, but we're going to increase services. Um, and then lastly, down below, we'll have the uh, inclusive practices for our students and uh, make sure that we're also um, expanding our uh, Chromebook distribution in the Newport, I'm sorry, in the Corona Del Mar zone. So anyone can see we're doing a lot. We've made some modifications. Um, we're continuing to pilot and adopt material as it becomes available um, in accordance with when it's um, released by the State Board of Education. And, and we look at um, what is on the list and we make decisions for ourselves as a district about what if what is available is the best that is out there. And, um, and then we go through a, a lengthy process to go through uh, adoption and then subsequent implementation. And we really do look at that as a three-year cycle um, from start to to finish on um, once we adopt. Um, I also want to make sure you note that on uh, school climate and student engagement, um, you know, we had a, a tragedy mid-year and part of our response as a district was to um, hire Challenge Success to come and work with our families and work with our schools. And we will continue to provide that as needed. Obviously, it wasn't in the last plan, but we make adaptations, and so we uh, continue with that moving forward. And then we also have some additional staffing to uh, coordinator and student services and additional school psychologists. So um, the, the LCAP is, um, is a live, living document as much as possible, and I can already tell you there's things I'm working on for next year. <laughs> so, um, but we're, we're trying to be responsive to all of the needs. Um, 
in uh, parent involvement. Um, on the federal side, parent involvement is now being called parent and family engagement. And I would have changed our goal, but um, we're not changing our goal for another two years. So um, if you, when you see that we have a, um, a federal document, the local educational agency plan, you'll note that it's called family, um, parent and family engagement. And we really are talking about the same thing here. We'll make the adjustment in language later. Um, you'll notice on uh, number six, basic services and operations. Um, that's where we had, again, those Williams requirements. But you'll notice that the first bullet, we're going to augment existing safety and emergency policies, procedures, and practices. That, again, is uh, one of the things that we're doing around safety. You don't necessarily see a dollar amount tied to that, but it's a um, personal, um, personal investment, time um, in training, and time um, that we've already accounted for, but something that we're bringing to the surface. Also, you'll notice that we're adding the enhanced perimeter fencing to promote safety and controlled access to campus, as Ara had mentioned. Um, now, for goal seven, we had to go to a nine-point font <laughs> because there are so many things happening mm -hmm. there. Um, we're just really proud that um, we, we feel like we are supporting our, our academics at all grade levels. And then college and career readiness, the metrics for those is really a secondary metric. So that's why you see many things listed there as a secondary action and service. Um, but really, we do believe that by building a strong core in English language arts, math, history, science, music, that at the elementary levels that we are getting kids college and career ready. So um, one of the, the changes that we are making, if you'll notice the, um, the last bullet in the top section, we've moved the instructional coaches. When we originally conceived of the coaches, they were for math, English, science, and history. And they were content specific to bring in the Common Core. Well, we've been bringing in the Common Core for a while, and what we're doing now is shifting to looking at our instructional practice, how we're designing our lessons, how we're engaging students, and how in particular we're making sure we're engaging our English learners. So um, that's we've always had them, we're just shifting the location and then we're also moving the funds. Um, and lastly, of course, uh, our signature academies. One of the things that we're recognizing is that our academies and our career tech ed pathways have come together and have been synonymous for quite a while. We want to make sure that we're identifying properly which things are career tech ed pathways and which things are standalone academies. So um, all of those things are listed here. So if anybody doesn't want to read all 302 pages, <laughs> then you can uh, look for the four-page document. As I mentioned before, we're going to have an LCAP addendum. You don't see it now. You'll see it later in the summer. And that is to cover our federal funds. It will look very different than the LCAP. The um, template is very different. And it doesn't um, ask for the same kind of dollar um, delineation. What it asks for is more about what we plan. Because most of the dollars are actually in our local control accountability plan. So the, um, the addendum supplements that and talks about specifically some of the requirements under the federal Every Student Succeeds Act. Um, that is also something that I will be spearheading and uh, we'll bring back to you um, in August. And uh, the consolidated application, that is the formal application that we make to the state for the federal funds each year and then mid-year we do a report of expenditure. So you put all those three components together and that fits under the requirements of the Every Student Succeeds Act and our, as our district plan. So again, you can find the LCAP on our website. If you just type in the letters LCAP, you'll see it there. Um, there may be some adjustments to the LCAP between now and next week. If anybody finds a typo, please let me know. And, um, and, and we'll make sm some small adjustments and make sure you know what they are. OK. With that, I'm going to turn it over to my partner in not crime. <laughs> that was really great. Yeah. This is a great great document. I think we're just all kind of blown away by this document since we started this. It's, um, it just tells everything we're doing. It's right there and uh, measures it and it's, it's wonderful. You're the LCAP queen. It's, it's daunting. <laughs> it's daunting. But, I don't know how but readable. Know. I mean, yeah, exactly. you've made it so that even if you don't speak educationese, you can, you can understand yeah. what's going on. You may get tired halfway through it and go, oh my gosh, but you, if you power through it, you know what's going on in our district. It's about as transparent a document as we could have, except for the one we're going to hear now. Okay, I, uh, Mrs. <laughs> Mrs. Floor has a quick question. Yeah, and it's really, it's just a comment, and again, um, Mrs. Gailey, you did a phenomenal job. As and usual. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah, as usual. It's just fabulous. Um, I just want to pay particular attention to item seven, which is the college and career readiness. Um, my only concern is there appears to be a lot of bullets for college and very few for um, 
career readiness. I know we, we mentioned Naviance, we mentioned multiple career pathways and industry sectors. We talk about the college night. But I hope that that can be expanded because it's not just going to college. It may be also a certificate pro program in a, in a, in a like a UT, you know, UT, uh, uni you know, Universal Technology Institute mm -hmm. for cars or mm -hmm. whatever it is. I just want, I want, I want a little bit more emphasis on what we're really doing in terms of career and technical, you know, the, 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 the career portion. So, so that's just my, season. that's just my, we will take thing. that under advisement. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Well, it's good to be with you tonight. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting in the, in the um, budget, there's a, a very particular carve out and you see that in the LCAP report. And if we were a LCFF district, we're community funded, but if we were an LCFF district, this is kind of the pieces of funding that you would see uh -huh. that we would get. We'd get a base grant and then a grade span adjustment and supplemental grant, a concentration grant, maybe some targeted uh, grants and then home to school transportation. Now, uh, you don't get any of that. <laughs> <laughs> but you do get uh, property tax. And so you can see on the left-hand side of that screen the value of the property tax. And you can see then also the value of what we'd get under an LCFF model. And that's a great compliment to this community, the value that this community generates. Um, it's a, a, absolutely a, a great testament to what this community does. So, but um, looking on the particular parts there, you'll see the base grant, we'd get 163.7 million and a grade span adjustment, 6.1 million. But then you come to that supplemental grant and take a look at that supplemental grant. That is 16.2 million. And that is the piece that is particularly carved out and put in the LCAP. And that is the piece that is, is meant to go to what's called the unduplicated pupil or those who um, are economically disadvantaged foster youth, and English learners. And, and so that's the piece that we watch very carefully and, and we document very carefully. <clears throat> and we do that and, and, and you, you might hear, and this is important for you to know, because you may hear sometime what's called the uh, minimum proportionality requirement. And, and this is critical that we meet this requirement. Uh, it's required by the state and the way it's calculated is we take what's called our supplemental grant, and that's a calculation that's done. And again, remember, you don't gain money for this. Yeah. <laughs> but we take this supplemental grant, and that's worth $16.2 million. And you divide that by, again, what, you're, what we would get for the, the uh, base grant and the, gr and the grade span adjustment. That's $169 million. And you come up with the percentage. And that percent, that percent, 9.53%, that's the percent that we need to be spending on the unduplicated pupil over and above what all other students receive. So that's, that's, a, that's a critical thing. Now that doesn't mean though that, that we're, we always have to spend more money. I particularly heard uh, Vanessa <laughs> say that we don't have to spend more money and that's really not the goal because you know these funds are not restricted they're targeted. And so we have a lot of, um, uh, uh, how do you say, um, uh, flexibility on utilizing the dollars and improving services. And sometimes that doesn't uh, cost money to improve mm -hmm. services. And, and so uh, anyways, I just wanna tell you um, how uh, great it's been to work with uh, Vanessa. She is absolutely a, a team player. Um, I, I don't think, Ed services and uh, fiscal have been any more uh, connected and on the same page than they ever have been than now. And so it's really just been absolutely terrific. And when you think about transparency, um, <clears throat> you know, in the old days, you might have a budget committee and there might be five or six people on that committee and they spend time on the budget and that kind of thing. Um, but there was never this connection between the dollars and actually actual uh, actions and services that you see in the LCAP. And, and we're moving there as quickly as we can. In fact, I think you'll see some dramatic changes in our budget book in, in the future where we'll be much more, uh, it'll be much more of a companion to the LCAP report. 
And so anyways, uh, it's really important for us to be transparent because every action and service for all students, but particularly, particularly those in that supplemental group, the unduplicated pupil is called out in the LCAP and you'll see that. And you've seen how uh, Vanessa does extensive, extensive community outreach. Uh, um, this, is, this is absolutely wonderful that we get this kind of feedback um, in, in the budgeting process. And then you've also, you know, in, in terms of when we do this, we also call out the variances. You'll see that in the, um, in, uh, what's it called? The update. And, and then uh, we describe general fund expenditures that are not included in the LCAPs, which means essentially every, the LCAP includes your entire general fund budget. And then in uh, 1920, you're going to look, uh, look forward to a new uh, parent uh, budget overview. And, um, and, and, and we're, we're, uh, the state's helping us with some, some things there to put into that. But we want to be right on the, on the cutting edge there, making that transparent for parents. And so <clears throat> let's talk about then uh, what's impacting us in terms of the money. And so if you think about what drives our, our budget, and it's really property taxes, the, the values of, of property here within the district. And this has been an absolutely um, wonderful streak, winning streak in terms of returns uh, year over year. And this year, we're going to experience a 7% increase in property uh, tax revenue compared to the previous year. That's outstanding. That's, that really is that's absolutely wonderful. However, um, that's not going to last. And so we've been um, really conservative on the out years. Everything we read from Chapman University to uh, this study here that was um, published in the Wall Street Journal survey of economists about home values is the trend is down in the out years. And so we are being conservative. Next, this in your budget year, uh, in 1819, we have predicted a 4.3% uh, growth in, in property values. Now that's a that's a still growing and, and still a pretty healthy number, but it's down from the seven percent that we experienced this this year. And uh, and that's important because we have to be in the right ballpark on property values. <laughs> we cannot be in the wrong ballpark. That would be uh, that would be really bad after. for us. And so um, part of what's happening here, if you look at this blue line here, this is our revenue line. That's a, that's a wonderful line. Isn't that great? We, we want this line. Uh, we want to see this all the time. But the only problem is, is we got with this other line, our expense line. <laughs> and, and so when you see um, Still under the blue. This, uh, this, the, these two lines, you, you don't ever want them to touch. Um, <laughs> never should they ever touch. And we want the space between them to be uh, a reasonable uh, space between them and you can see it's it's getting tighter and tighter as we go and we're watching that we're watching that but this tells you that we're living within our means and um, you're doing a lot you're doing an awful lot you're going to spend 27 million dollars this summer it's going to be a bonanza uh, in terms of air conditioning and, and construction that's going on out at the sites and so you're pushing um, that's probably not the right word but you're with the the, the organization is being pushed to move forward on these priorities in, a, in a, a pretty heavy way, and we're moving as quickly as we can. Now, one of the problems or, or one of the challenges that we're going to have here is, is uh, pensions. Mm -hmm. Employers are charged for CalSTRS and CalPERS a percent based on salary. And you can see from these lines here, these are em employer pension rates. For CalPERS, CalPERS is in the red, CalSTRS is in the blue. And you see how these rates have gone up dramatically. And this, this is, uh, uh, take note, this is during an, uh, an expansion in our economy. And these rates are going up like this. And yes, the, the, the pension systems are digging themselves out of a hole. And I suppose first rule is when digging yourself out of a hole is to stop digging. <laughs> and, and they're trying to do that, but this is concerning. This is concerning um, for us, especially, because if the economy slows or a recession happens, good grief, what, what are these rates going to do? And so this is, a, this is probably something that a, a problem is bigger than us, but you as being elected officials should know this is a, this is a problem that needs to, to be addressed, probably at the state level. Um, 
and, and part of this issue is, is you can see on the blue lines, the bars going up, that's the total cost. But that red line, this is the red, the red line is the one that is most concerning. This, that red line tells you that in 1314, pension costs were about 5% of our total budget. In 2021, pension costs are predicted to be of almost 12% of our budget. So pension costs are taking a larger uh, bite out of the pie, so to speak. So something else has to give, and, and that's a problem for us. It's a problem, and, and I hope that um, you know, we can get that message across um, uh, to the state. But in the, <clears throat> you're still maintaining a uh, re deliberate and responsible reserve. You can see here in 17-18, um, we're, we're predicted to reduce that reserve somewhat because of uh, the tremendous amount of work in facilities and in um, uh, adoptions that we've been doing. And so this is still a responsible reserve and it's appropriate to take it down somewhat to move forward on your priorities. However, so, <clears throat> but when we look at the budget, it's prudent. We anticipate some uncertainty. We predicted that, we put that in our assumptions. We've incorporated your district priorities and we're consistent with the local control uh, accountability plan. And we have yeah. to say that the district yes. is solvent and moving forward. Yes. So we can't end that without saying that. And so consequently, we recommend the budget to you and we look forward to any feedback that you might have between now and the time that we adopted at our next uh, meeting. So thank you so much for your time. You. See, I thought, Mr. Trader, you would say we're in the pink. Yeah. Oh, with your time. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we have some questions. Okay, uh, Ms. Matoye. Ms. Has the employee contributions to the pension flattened yet? I think it was this year, hasn't it? The, the employee contribution increased. The state's, everybody's contribution to the pensions increased. But I know that the employees stopped while ours kept going and have the employees in both groups stopped yet? On, on the CalPER side, on the classified side, they, they have remained somewhat fixed. However, it is um, calculated on 50% uh, of the normal cost. So there, the employees' cost could go up somewhat. So depending on, on how those calculations come out. So that could that could move. On the, on the CalPER, CalSTER side, um, their rates are going up on the employee okay. side somewhat. Okay. <laughs> but I, I'm... I'm not sure on the on the out years how how far they're projected to go oh, up. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Yelsey. Uh, yeah, I just I want to thank you both. This is a great presentation for you to do this mm -hmm. together, mm -hmm. and and I love the pink. I think you guys oh. look <laughs> look great. And and you know, Vanessa, I want to thank you for taking each of us through mm -hmm. some by small groups, some individually. I know you did it a lot of times. You always have a smile on your face when you're doing that. <laughs> and uh, it's obvious you love it and you make us love it by just the energy in the room. So thank you for that. And the the budget book, it, it we had it delivered to our houses on Friday, and my husband says to me, why are you getting the book? Why aren't you getting it electronically? And I said, because I like to sit on the couch yes. and read it and hold it. It's like a good book you want to read, and it's and true. We do it read does it. tell yeah, the story do. of our district. Yes. So yep. I just really appreciate the way you present this to us and what you give to evaluate how we're doing. And, uh, and I appreciate that we are moving forward and are solvent. Thank Very you. Appreciate Thank you. Ms. Floor. Again, I, I commend both of you. I would hope that um, we can have the PowerPoints, these PowerPoints. Those PowerPoints are great. Um, they're, they're fabulous. And I know that in the, with the new, the new agenda online, you can embed the PowerPoints into the LC. I mean, the reason we know, know that is because we attended CSPA and the annual conference uh, at the delegate assembly, and the, the actual PowerPoints are embedded. They're on the agenda online, and you just have to click and you get the PowerPoints. And so that would be really helpful. And I think that it's really helpful for the, the public to be able to see them 
um, while you're talking through, but sometimes they just want to read, you know, read them. So, and they were fabulous again. I do have a question about the election. I couldn't find it, and maybe I'm just blind and didn't read it. through. Did you find it? I was uh, just um, cost because of the election. Yes. Yeah, yeah, because it's. Have we gotten an actual cost? Because it's actually it's four separate elections because there's, well, we have five elections that we have to right. pay for this year. Is that correct? Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so did, are they, I know, well, it's in here, but mm -hmm. it's more than last year or two years ago. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to get some some conversations about and just um, if we I'm could have just uh, not now but you know in the future okay. at next at the next meeting to talk about um, the various because we it was indicated to us that in terms of candidates and and the cost would be go down a li would go down but it appears that it's gone it's going up. We'll, we'll we'll be prepared for that. Great, yeah. thank you. Okay, any other comments? Bravo. Oh, uh, we, Mr. Yes. Great. <laughs> Thank you. No. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to be leaving around now. No, yes, it does. Oh. I'm going to be leaving around now, but I just wanted to thank you guys again for the great times this year. Uh, my successor, uh, I'm working on making sure that he is as dedicated or hopefully more so than I was. Um, thank you. Just thanks a lot. I love you guys. It's been great. See you guys later. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. We're going to miss Drop you. Yeah. <laughs> and thank your, thank your mom for, Can I do for stepping up there and, and actually this? being there all the time. Thank yeah. you. Really. Okay. We're going to move on to public hearings. So you can open the public hearing. Okay. So I'm opening a public hearing 15A, Local Control and Accountability Plan, LCAP. So I'm opening the public hearing. And you have one card here. Oops, I'm sorry. One card here. Okay, this is on LCAP. Okay, and I have a speaker, Erica Roberts. We don't have 14 seats. We can hold comments. Oh, the public hearing is on the LCAP and the All Funds Final Budget. Those are the two things you can speak <coughs> on here. Oh, this is 50. Okay. Yeah, on the report. Go ahead. <coughs> um, 15, once. Once. No, once. 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 Oh, well, it's two oh, different hearings. But she's got two cards in one for A, which is LCAP, and then when you have a public hearing <coughs> for the all funds, she could speak she yes. could speak right. to yeah. no fifteen B. Right. There's no comment, public comment on reports. So that's why we have the public hearing section. Right, so it's, it's fifteen, not fourteen. So fifty you're speaking on uh, the LCAP right now. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, members of the board and valued community members. My name is Eric Roberts. I'm a school site council, my school's foundation, and a very active mom of four children. I care about their educational and emotional experience in this district. I want to thank Vanessa Gailey and Ch Jeff Trader for the LCAP explanation. Um, I want to share with you my experience. When I first joined uh, school site council, I wanted to educate myself on my responsibilities in the LCAP. It stands for Local Controlled Accountability. Local control and accountability, and that sounded great. Through my journey and interest, I spent time understanding the goals of the LCAP in the past, and now with this new um, one put up. I think it is the responsibility of this district to make sure that parents understand how valuable and important it is to their community. This takes better communication and best practices on getting surveys out. Um, there is a document in the LCAP, and it says 2% of uh, parent feedback of the 1,574 <coughs> responses and some schools only had 1%, so we went up about 251 responses in the district. I think we can do more. Newport Mesa <coughs> District is locally funded. We are not like other districts. 80% of the money that pays for salaries, classroom maintenance, cars, gas, technology, curriculum, lawsuits, bonuses, and sometimes huge financial mistakes. This is all paid for with our hard-earned taxpaying dollar. As such, it feels that LCAP isn't understood by parents to be as serious as it should be. We paid Han over $60,000 to help with the LCAP survey, and the numbers only went up a couple hundred for parents and teachers. Again, it went up from 1,323 to 1,574. So here is some free advice from me. If you please send out the LCAP in the future through principals that we know and PTA leaders that we trust, you will get more responses than sending them out through a secretary that nobody knows. Parents are overwhelmed and will just hit delete, and this is a fact. 
When it comes from a principal, parents will open it. The district must do a better job of communicating. People I talk to at our schools in leadership positions don't know about the LCAP or what it really does. I sat on school site council and I had to explain it because I looked into it. So if you look at the results within that 300 page document, which I printed it all out, um, the most improvement that they were looking for is people aren't really happy with the facilities. The fields looked fine, but the schools and some other things are, are not going great. Teachers want more planning time. If you look on the responses, um, it's like 40%, it's, it's not good. And remember, we're in a curriculum change, and that takes a lot for teachers. Parents desperately want our classroom sizes reduced. We talked about that last time. Dr. Navarro did a um, presentation saying the average was 28, but what I'm finding is that classrooms are 36, 35 with new curriculum. And we want better mental health for our kids. If these percentages were test scores, we would be failing. Please put our children and teachers first by working together and informing parents. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, oh, go ahead. Real quickly, mm -hmm. I just want to uh, express that uh, Hanover contract is not only for the survey. The Hanover contract, uh, the survey was only a piece of that. They've done several research uh, uh, projects for us, and uh, so I don't want it to be misconstrued mm -hmm. that a, a survey cost us $60,000. It did not cost us $60,000. That was one part of several projects that, uh, uh, projects that they've worked with uh, the district on. Thank you for that clarification. Okay, uh, any other speakers? I'm going to close the um, public hearing. Okay. What? Yeah. For that one. 15B. For 15A or 15B? Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay. We're getting to you. <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to open the public hearing for 15B, which is the 2018 19 All Funds Final Budget. It's open. Okay, and so I have only one card. That's not you. No, uh, I think he's on public comments. Oh, public comments. Yeah, which we okay. haven't got to Sorry. yet. We're Sorry, we're not there. Uh, okay, Erica Roberts. So we're on 15B, just to clarify. Exactly. Sorry, can you please start over? Sure, I wasn't quite ready, I'm sorry. Um, again, my name is Erica Roberts, and I'm talking about 15B. Um, basically, Dr. Navarro, you had your staff give a presentation a few weeks ago on how we compare to other districts and what the average classroom sizes were. You said it was 28. The data from um, this document that Martha gave to me shows that the numbers are very different. Hopefully, you'll have this. But the numbers you presented were from 2015, and they were presented at the 2018 meeting. We don't need to go to such extents to do these presentations. This document from Martha shows that what the classroom sizes really are right now. TK has like 15 and 13 kids, so that will affect the classroom size in the, um, in the range or average. I think we need to take a good hard look at what we are doing to teachers and kids and families, and the LCAP is our document. The title says it is locally controlled and it's for accountability. We want more say in how our money is being spent. We want supplements like Moby Max that Anderson is using, it's one of the best performing schools to be used across the district and paid for with our money. We want classroom sizes to have 25 kids in the class or less. Anderson has 18 kids and 20 kids in sixth grade. Compare that to College Park in this document. One teacher in sixth grade has 38 students in her room. I don't know many teachers who can take an additional 20 students, 18 plus the 20, and be highly effective in the learning process without being stressed out. When you have 38, 36, and 35 children in elementary, you can't even get to know them. You barely are staying afloat. I implore you to take a good hard look at how we load the classrooms for 2018-19 school year. Martha, you were told that the teachers at Mariners didn't want another sixth grade teacher, and that's why the classes were at 35. This is a false statement. I wish it's that not. one of you would talk to them. They did want another teacher, but it wasn't um, given. They got an aid instead if they wanted it. Um, these teachers are teaching in non-air conditioned rooms, implementing two new programs with little time to team plan. You're going to burn teachers out. Our kids deserve better. We have the money. It's our money. Over 300 million 
and we need to stop spending it on lawsuits and frivolous things like bonuses. Put the money back into the classrooms, and if you want to give anyone a raise, it should be the teachers over at College Park who have 20 more students per year in one classroom than their professional peers <coughs> at Anderson, again, with 18 and 20 kids. The teachers are doing all the heavy lifting. Over 300 million in our budget, and our facilities are not great. We need more mental health counselors, psychologists, time for teachers to plan and dig into this new curriculum that they've been given for two um, language arts and math. We would like a huge improvement with equity, transparency, and parent communication. After all, it is the job of the school board. Um, I hope that we can improve. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And I have another speaker, Ashley Anderson. Hello. Hello. Good evening. Um, thank you for the LCAP and the budget overview. Um, it was really helpful and informative. Um, I love the quote that was inside that said the budget is not just a collection of numbers, but an expression of our values and our aspirations. That was beautiful. <laughs> a majority of our budget goes to educators, which is as it should be. They directly impact and instruct our students, our first priority. Yet we currently have a district divided. There are families who can afford to supplement their local schools with foundations and donations to buy essentials like additional staffing, services, and supplies. And there are other families with less income, soaring rents, yet a hopeful belief that their local school is doing its very best for their students. I believe that we can and we should do more to create equal access to exceptional public school education. Equity and equality are two strategies we can use in an effort to produce fairness. Equality is treating everyone the same. However, equity is giving everyone what they need to be successful. Equality aims to promote fairness, but it can only work if everyone starts from the same place and needs the, sa the same help. Equity ensures equal access. I am grateful to learn from Jeff about the 9% that should go to make things more fair. I do understand that we need to be reasonable with funds and um, with the revenue and with things that are going on with um, property taxes. Title I funds are essential, but often they are not enough. In 2017-18, all, all nine of the Title I schools combined um, received $461,000 from school-connected organizations. In 2018-19, it was less. It was $4,000 and $10,000 all combined. While in 2018-19, Davis alone raised $410,000. Newport Coast, over $368,000. Anderson raised over $329,000. Mariners, over $317,000. These schools raise donations primarily for three purposes, additional staff, services, and supplies. These are three areas of great need across the district. Kudos to these parents who have the means and the inclination to make such a significant contribution to their local schools. It does make a huge difference. I would like to make a few recommendations. To utilize the money in the budget creatively, be it through unrestricted revenue funds or the state lottery, or unrestricted state funding to make up for the gaps. Um, unrestricted revenue has increased most years and would be a game changer for Title I schools. There was 272 million last year and now there's 286 million. Let's use each of these in innovative and creative ways for our schools. Another idea, assess and link all funding, but especially that allocated to Title I schools in the district to measurable and concise outcomes to ensure the programs are delivered and make an impact. If this is done, please let us know more. Thank also, you. if we can form a Citizens pro a Budget Oversight Committee to have study sessions about the budget. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay. You yes. I, I think you have to have a clear understanding of all the facts when you talk about you know how we provide equity. Uh, equality is something we do through the general fund. Every student, every every school gets an equal amount of the general fund. But then you do talk about the LCAP uh, concentration, mm -hmm. and that doesn't. And I'm, I'm trying to correct me if I'm wrong, but that doesn't include our federal funds when we do the LCAP. That's correct. Yeah. So the federal fund comes in uh, to our Title One schools and brings in an additional 11 million dollars. Mm -hmm. 
to those schools. So uh, there is uh, 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 part of what the state has done with the LCAP is to build in some equity. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, and equity is about not what, not what everybody gets, it's about what everybody needs. Mm -hmm. And so they've already identified those unduplicated students who happen to be your students who come mostly from poverty or from very challenging situations, family situations, and they have already uh, required us to figure out how to use that money on those kids. Uh, that money cannot be used and should not be used, and there are some districts who are in trouble using their LCAP and their, um, what, their concentration funds, which are, is above the, above the, uh, uh, the supplemental, uh, for th uh, that, were, that are used for salaries. Mm -hmm. uh, for employees, you really can't, you have to use that for services to students. So uh, we have, uh, we do have uh, money that goes to those campuses, the LCAP plus the $11 million from the federal funds. Thank you. Okay, uh, no Oops. more speak. Oh, I just wanted to I'm ask sorry. a I, I apologize. Ms. I'm Sanchez. sorry. Uh, and it may be it's something for Vanessa, but I remember when we were, Vanessa was taking us through the LCAP. And something that struck me, because I think it relates to this, is as an example, Whittier will have next year seven or eight 19 and a half hour employees. Is that correct? Teachers. They already have in that chatting. Yes, so a couple of years ago when we uh, took another look at our federal funds, we reallocated how we were supporting our, um, our Title I schools. So we have uh, different buckets of federal funding, some that are allocated to the district, some that we then disperse to the school site. So each of our Title I elementary schools has one district funded 19.5 hourly support out of district Title I. Then the sites have discretion to decide how they're going to spend their site level Title I. And so I believe that they currently have three that they are paying for out of their own. And then at the um, district level, out of our LCFF dollars, what we have done is looked at the graduated uh, levels of need. And so schools like Whittier, Wilson, Pomona, Ray, they have, and College Park, they have three 19.5 hourly support out of LCFF. And then some schools have two and some schools have one. So you'll notice on our... Um, our sheet here. Oh, excuse me. I'm, I'm sorry. I had that reversed. That was my title one dollars. Mm -hmm. LCFF covers one for each of the needy schools. And so for the non title one schools, that's why they have to use their own funds to at least so for the non-Title yeah, I schools, we also have schools that have higher levels of need, California, um, Newport Heights, and uh, Woodland, and Kaiser. And um, we also then provide at the secondary level some dollar amounts depending on what the schools need. So for instance, LCFF dollars cover um, a, a part of a counselor and um, one section of um, intervention at Newport Harbor. At Ensign, it's different depending on what they needed. So um, at, the, at the elementary schools I just mentioned, LCFF dollars um, go toward 19.5 support, as well as some additional classified support that we didn't call out in this presentation. So then, <clears throat> just as a comparison, what does a school like Anderson get? I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, generally, the those schools have other funds that they've been using for um, whatever they've determined that they need, and that's through their local process to determine their need. So um, my charge was to look at the LCFF funds in terms of the neediest okay. students first. Mm -hmm. um, also remember that historically we used to get funds called economic impact aid, mm -hmm. and those were from the state as a categorical, and so we put those out on a per pupil basis. We adjusted that years ago to try and look again to the neediest schools getting the most resources. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mrs. Floor. Um, Vanessa, could you explain concentrate? <laughs> I, I'm sorry, but one of the things you talked about in terms of is concentration. Yes. And we have needy students throughout our district. Correct. At the 22,000, we have we have we have students in every single school. Yes. That have are English language learners, mm -hmm. are socioeconomic, they're in poverty, mm -hmm. um, they're in Section 8 housing, mm -hmm. um, you name it, they're all across the district. But a lot of the Title I and our funds have to go to concentration. Can you explain what a concentration is one more time? 
So, um, so what we have done is looked at the unduplicated students and we've looked at the percentages of students at our different schools. So concentration funds are not something that we need to be concerned about in our district because we don't meet the definition. We don't have the 55% or more threshold. So in those districts, if you remember um, the, the picture that, that Jeff shared, you have the base funds and then you have supplemental and that's for one for each unduplicated student. When you have districts that have higher concentrations of um, yeah. students in that count, mm -hmm. over the 55 percent they get an additional dollar amount so if you think about a place like a Los Angeles Unified or a Santa Ana mm -hmm. they have higher levels of students in higher concentrations of need now a school like Whittier has about 98 percent unduplicated and um, followed by them I think it's College Park and then Ray and we, and we have a, a chart that ranks them so each year we look at our counts and what we do is try and differentiate our support um, and and we look at that based on what the what the principals have requested over time and what they found that they thought was going to be most impactful with support in small group instruction and really looking at the support and foundational skills. Some of it is about <coughs> math. So it's all based on historically what they have asked for and it has been in response to those requests. So, but for, con for purposes of a concentration, we don't get a concentration of funds, but we look and we, we realize that a school like Whittier that is so large and has so much need, they might need more than mm -hmm. say um, a, an Adams. Right, which is also a Title I school, mm -hmm. and yet doesn't have as high a concentration of students in need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I am going, no more cards, I'm gonna close the public hearing on uh, all funds budget. Okay, now, uh, Dr. Navarro. Yes, we have an informational item today, and I'm gonna ask Mr. Lee Sung to share that with you. So I'm going to take this opportunity to share some information about uh, some of the exciting things we're doing in the area of safety. Uh, there's been a lot happening and working with a lot of folks, speaking in front of a lot of groups, but I just want to highlight uh, four areas related to safety. The first one is uh, we have officially launched a uh, page on our website dedicated to safety. I want to thank Annette Franco uh, for putting that together. Uh, it's got a lot of, uh, I think, very important and useful information related to safety, and we'll continue to use that web page to add and update uh, additional information. So I do encourage everybody to take a look at that. Uh, later on on this uh, agenda, we're going to be approving uh, or recommending for approval a district-wide emergency communication system. And as we know, when it comes no, to please. communication, when we're dealing with emergencies, uh, that is a very, very uh, critical uh, you know, system that we need to have in place. And so we will be recommending to you uh, a district-wide uh, system, which is uh, gonna be Titan, uh, and we'll, you'll hear more on that. But uh, we're very excited to, uh, to spread that uh, district-wide. Uh, the other thing that I'd like to announce is that we've been working uh, quite some time on a, um, a bulletin or a safety bulletin related to high heat days. And we know it's starting to heat up a little bit now, and we know come the fall we're going to be dealing with some uh, excessive heat days at that time. And we've been doing, as we all know, a lot of things to accommodate uh, students and staff uh, on those days. And uh, the memo that I'm putting together will have those things that we've always done, such as, you know, giving flexibility to the school site, to the teachers to change subjects so that they're, uh, the important topics are done at the cooler part of the day, flexibility to move classes around to cooler parts of the um, campus, and, and probably the most important thing is to keep kids hydrated. And we know how important that is, particularly for, for young children, uh, to make sure they're hydrated. But there's going to be another aspect of that that we are pleased to announce, and with the support of Dr. Navarro and the board, uh, that we will have uh, some language in there related to an early release on those very, very excessively hot days. Uh, that would be a two-hour early release for our elementary schools and middle schools that do not have air conditioning. And uh, we, we chose not to include the high schools at this time because they are about 50% air conditioned and they have a lot of flexibility amongst the site to, to move kids around. And it's very difficult at the high school level uh, to end school 
um, uh, early. Uh, so we're going to uh, just focus on the elementary and the middle school, and I will be putting that out uh, to our principals and to post it on our uh, district website. And the last thing is next board meeting on June 26, I will give you a full update and a full report on many things that are occurring uh, in, in the area of safety. Thank you. Ms. Um, Mr. Lee Sung, what are you, um, what are we basing the early release numbers on? So uh, we are, uh, we've been looking at the San Diego Unified uh, School District criteria for that and uh, use that as kind of our benchmark uh, to determine uh, which day we would use for an early uh, release. And we felt that was a good criteria to use, so we're going to model it after that, which is a 95 percent, uh, I'm sorry, 95, 95 degree or higher temperature and a heat index of 103. So that's the, the model for uh, And San they cover Diego some pretty hot have. territory, the San Diego Unified. Yes. Yes. Are there any other school districts that, that have uh, early release for high school in, in California? You know, I, I'm not aware what I've, I did look at a few districts and their safety pages. And I didn't see any absolute criteria other than the one at San Diego. And they're the, they're the fourth largest district in, the, in, in California. It may even be the second. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. So moving on to community input on consent and non-agenda items. And our first speaker is you want me Edwin. To read this? Oh, I'm sorry. What did I do? You're supposed to read this? To read oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> speaker cards for items on the con discussion action calendar will be held until that item is considered by the board. This is an opportunity for the public to address the board on consent calendar agenda items or on non-consent items within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board per board policy 9323. Each individual speaker will have three minutes to cover one or multiple topics, and speakers may not cede unused minutes to other speakers, and there is a maximum of 20 minutes of comments per topic. With board consent, the president may increase or decrease the time allowed for public comments, depending on the topic and the number of persons wishing to speak. The board, staff, and members of the public may request that a specific item on consent be moved to the consent uh, discussion action a uh, request to move consent items must be received prior to the time the board takes action on the consent calendar. Any persons with a disability who requires reasonable accommodation to participate in a board meeting may request it, um, assistance by contacting the superintendent's office at 2985 Bear Street, Costa Mesa, California, uh, phone number 714-424-5031. When addressing the board, it is helpful that you state your name and address for the record. All comments are recorded in full on the board meeting video record that is posted as a courtesy on our board, on our website at www.nmusd.us. Thank you. Okay, our first speaker is Edwin Bell. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, Ms. Snyder was kind enough to distribute my statement because my students as well as my colleagues know there's no way I can talk for three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, the most important thing that I want to bring to mind is that as a teacher at uh, Newport Harbor High School, I could not be prouder of being affiliated with this district. I did my student teaching at CDM. I spent 11 years at Costa Mesa High School. Mm -hmm. I spent uh, summers uh, teaching summer school at Estancia, and now I'm in my fifth year at Newport Harbor. Um, there are so many incredible things going on. And most of my students are underperforming, reluctant learners who also are socioeconomically disadvantaged. And we're still doing great things. But the thing that sticks in my mind is I went to a professional development and they made a comment that stuck with me. For every one negative thing, a student needs to hear eight positive things to counteract that. So I couldn't help but take note of the April and May issue regarding our rodent problem at Newport Harbor. And I said, you know what? It's a reality, we're dealing with it. Because a majority of mice and rats can fit through a hole the size of a quarter. I challenge anybody to show me a facility that doesn't have an opening where that's possible. So there's a number of variables, but one of them is 
again, cleaning up our campus. And from day one, Principal Bolton has spearheaded a clean campus program where we have made sure that we've done everything we possibly can. We added trash cans. We actually even had shirts made up. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> <laughs> for our staff to be able to promote the team effort. I've been out along with administration and security walking the campus, reminding kids respectfully and kindly to throw away trash. Mm -hmm. Because with 2,400 students, rats are going to take advantage of that. But the things that I really want to focus on are the positives. Principal Bolton from day one has been there as the champion for the kids, he's been a champion for the teachers, and he does so many things that I really truly believe deserve his recognition. And the latest thing that he's launched, which I am a proud member to be a part of, is the Newport Harbor Cares Initiative, which is dealing with mental wellness mm -hmm. and helping our students deal with anxiety, depression, mm -hmm. and the issues that are facing them and preventing them from being successful students as well as citizens. I could go on for minutes, probably hours, <laughs> talking about so many great things that are happening at Newport Harbor. But Principal Bolton is an incredibly sensitive, caring, strong leader who does everything in the best interest of our school. He truly lives by the motto, you'll get more done if you're not concerned with who gets the credit. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you very much. Did you just give him a 20? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, it's great. Thank you. It was nice to hear. Um, okay, next speaker is Susan Seeger. She left. Oh, did she leave? Oh, darling. Okay. She wanted to talk about the OC Equestrian Center. She's been speaking about that. Um, Erica Roberts. I know. I want to write down her name, too, because I want to get in touch with her. Hello again. Oh. My name is Erica Roberts. I'm a community member, um, very active in our community own a business and I'm here to um, have a public comment. First I would like to say that Sean Bolton has proven himself to be a very true leader. You know he has a lot of respect and he takes um, accountability, he apologizes, he works with the kids and the parents, he's awesome. Russell Lee Sung, I want to thank you for the information on the heat days. Um, my understanding is the union has been asking for this for four years for student and staff. So it was necessary and it's better late than never. I am going to report back to my friend Lori Smith who will be pleased to know that you took her research and looked at San Diego as a model for Newport Mesa. So I think that's really awesome because when those classrooms hit 92 and 93 degrees and we have to have the doors locked, there's no reason kids should be in there. We wouldn't do that to animals. So we need to show our teachers and our kids respect. Um, going to classroom size, <clears throat> I would like to address that because I think it's so important. There's a lot of research showing that when classroom size is reduced, the teachers are going to know those kids. We know there's a lot of anxiety and angst in the classroom, even as young as second and third grade. Um, I've been talking to a lot of parents. I'm in the trenches with them, so I can tell you it's a true thing. And then it just grows as you know more responsibility is put on them. But we were told the average class was 28. I was lucky enough to have a meeting with Martha Floor back in March. She was very kind, and I have been waiting. And this week, I received the document without teacher names, but of all the numbers and classes. I was very curious about the classroom size and how we load classes and when we stop actually adding kids to the class. <coughs> Teachers and parents so desperately wanted, needed curriculum changes and the LCAP should have addressed this. Um, I believe the LCAP should also address classroom size. <coughs> it is my strong opinion that while teachers are implementing two new math curriculums for language arts and math, they should be supported and this district said they would support. High school will be piloting next year. My daughter, unfortunately, has either been with Swan Math in a pilot and now a pilot next year. So it hasn't been a great experience on the math side for us personally. Board, it would behoove you to make sure that these wonderful teachers are not overwhelmed with 38 students in non-air conditioned classrooms with two new curriculums without much time to support each other or team plan. Martha Floor gave me the class document and I'd like to share with you some important data. 20 was the average, remember. At College Park, we have 30 and 36 kids in two different classrooms. If we made one more teacher at that grade level, sixth grade, that could turn it into 25, 25, and 24. That's way more manageable. Anderson has 18 and 20 again. Ray, 33 and 35. Whittier, 34 and 32. My question is, how is putting 38 kids into a class with new curriculum supporting kids and teachers? We can do better. You said we should support teachers and go slow. 
lower classroom size should be mandatory. It would be respectful to our teachers and our kids. Please um, consider that. It would be really important. Also, one more um, statement. This document, I think, would be very helpful to school site council parents going in because we really don't know what we're doing. So if you Excuse gave me. this, yes, if you gave yes. this and to PTA, people would much. understand. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, our next speaker is Annie Lent. She left. Ah, oh, shoot. <laughs> you took too long. Okay. Do you want to take a break? Uh, do you want, would you like to take a break? I, it's, that would be I would nice. Like okay. Thank you. Um, we, I know since we've, um, all the speakers have spoken, we are going to take a five minute break. We'll be back at 8.31. <laughs> Okay, we're going to call the meeting back to order at 8.35. Um, and so now um, the consent calendar. Superintendent well, Superintendent report. He, hadn't fin he didn't do it yet. No, it's not time. It's, it's time for the... Oh, I see. I'm sorry. Okay. Yes, it's my uh, opportunity to report. Okay. Um, I want to uh, go back to this uh, issue that was brought up about class size. I think that uh, it's uh, uh, it's, incom it's incomplete information, and you shouldn't just present incomplete information. You should present complete information. Uh, averages are skewed, just like any measure of central tendency. Uh, that's why <coughs> you know real estate companies like to use a median instead of an average or a mode. Uh, so, uh, so when you look at a, a, a school, uh, you can see that there are bubbles. Unfortunately, like I've said many times, students don't come in packages of 24. No. <laughs> all right, and we always have one grade level that ends up there's there's a bubble. So uh, I can say if they're after looking at those uh, uh, enrollment reports that, that I get, we have every school that has one bubble where they've got. Uh, too many kids for two teachers and not enough for three teachers. Uh, and they make those decisions sometimes based on what the student needs are. They actually decide to have smaller class sizes maybe in, in, uh, in, the, in the early primary grades. I know when I was at Costa Mesa, we made a specific decision to load our AP classes with higher numbers and use that money, use that staffing to build smaller ELD classes mm -hmm. because those kids had more needs. Uh, so yeah, you could say there's 33, 35, but when you look at the average, the average just comes out to about 27, 28. I know that uh, Mrs. Floor uh, has some information on that because she has the uh, report that I uh, am uh, respond uh, that I'm re uh, referring to. Yeah, I just want to make some really um, some clarifying. I did send uh, Mrs. Roberts, uh, and I have emailed it to you, the the enrollment report, and it was a, a February. It was a February 5th um, enrollment report. And she mentioned College Park. And yes, College Park has two uh, sixth grade classes. There are no names attached that are 38 and 26. What she fails to tell you is that in uh, the fifth grade, there are three fifth grade classes. They are 27, 26, and 26. So next year, the presumption is that they will continue to be small class sizes. In the second grade, they are 18, 17, 22, and 28. Um, and the majority of all the classes in that school, other than the, the sixth grade, promoting sixth grade classes, are within, uh, well, uh, the, most of them are all 20, 27 or below, with only one class of 27. At Mariners, she also mentioned Mariners. Mariners currently, and let me scroll down to that one so I can give you an idea of what that one says. Um, Mariners currently has, yes, three classes, 33, 35, and 34. They also have uh, four fifth grade classes, 27, 28, 28, and 28. And in the fourth grade, it's 27, 28, 25. And actually in the second grade, it's 22, 22, 24, 23, and 21. They have five. So again, those numbers will, as those kids move up to the grade levels, they also will, like you said, Dr. Navarro, uh, bubble. Um, for Whittier, which is one of our largest schools, she also mentioned Whittier. And I just want to make sure that we have all the information when we're talking about this and not just. Um, it, at Sonora, for example, uh, 
the sixth grade has 25, 30, and 32. The fifth grade has 20, 27, and 22. The, fifth, the fourth grade is 21, 25, and 24. Um, so that's another uh, school. Victoria, the largest class size is 29 at uh, sixth grade, but the, and there's only two. And the, and the fifth grade is 27 and 20. And the second grade is 18 and 19. And then at Whittier, there are, there's that one combination class, which is at 29, 15 fifth graders, uh, 14 uh, sixth graders, 30, 31, and 32. And their uh, fifth graders are going to be large unless they do something and they may, may, may adjustment because they're 34, 33, and 33. But again, their second grade class is 20, 18, 17, 19, and 18. So again, as you said, Dr. Navarro, there is a, there's, a, there's a bubble that's moving, moving through of the large class sizes. As well as I believe you said, at a, Dr. Lee Sung mentioned at one point about class size, the fact that this district makes a really concerted effort to not have combo classes. And so according to this, there looks like there's like two combo classes one that's a kindergarten, uh, there's one kindergartner and then there's the rest is first grade and then there's that one other class. So I just want to give you a clear picture and I'm, you know, I certainly, um, I can email this so that everybody has the same documentation and I, I just want to underscore you. what uh, Ms. Flores said. We did, I Ed Division and the Budget Division worked very closely so that teachers wouldn't have combo classes if at all possible. And so to have really only two in the district is really quite an accomplishment. Uh, I know Ms. Matoy always had a combo class oh, yeah. that she had to deal with. Um, the other thing I wanted to discuss is that, you know, if I, uh, I would uh, be disingenuous if I only talked about the small classes, but we don't do that. So when we talked about your class sizes, we took uh, separate independent measures. The numbers I presented came from the Office of Civil Rights and a central tendency measure they use. Uh, that's not my number, that's their number. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to use that because it tells you what the other districts look mm -hmm. like. Um, and then uh, 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 Ms. Olson used a report from School Services of California when she talked about the class sizes averages in our district. And then Dr. Sir talked about, actually took the numbers off of our enrollment sheet. So you got three different points of information and to pick on just one is, in, is incomplete. Uh, it really is, you have to look at three different points. That gives you an idea of really where you sit with your class sizes. And we are committed, and the board has always been committed to smaller class sizes. Uh, and uh, that the fact that we have only two combo classes in the whole district is really quite an, uh, an accomplishment. And I know that that's something that the Ed Division wants to continue. Oh, Ms. Matoye. And I... <laughs> Being a former principal. elementary yeah. principal, I know you were a high school principal, but being a former elementary principal, when I read our first list chapter, hearing how we were gonna have no combos, and that popped right up there for me at Whittier, and I went, <gasps> and then I went and talked to the Whittier principal, and their site wanted that. They had a specific reason, they had a specific groups of kids, and that's one of the things that's, that's it's, the staffing numbers were determined then the, then the configurations that could possibly be made were decided, and then the sites had decision-making process. And when I say sites had decision-making, I don't mean all the teachers sat around and decided, but the lead team hour, however each site principal made their decision, a lot of sites chose to have lower class sizes in grades K through three and take the burden on with the upper, upper grades. And speaking as someone who taught in upper grades, I would have been willing to do that. Now, 38 kids, that's a lot of bodies in a classroom, physically a lot of bodies, totally understand that. But if it's that one bubble or five kids came in over winter break, it was 32 or 33, mm -hmm. It's 38 gets to be ginormous. And, and I do wanna uh, let you know that uh, the Ed Division did increase uh, staffing at one school where it became much too big in a kindergarten uh, uh, grade level, mm -hmm. it just was, too large, so an intervention teacher was added to manage that. And sometimes they'll, Ed Division will offer, and the teachers are going, well, no, I know my kids, I, I know them now, and how I do we tell the them. parents that we're gonna take the kids apart, and they're all their friends and everything, and that's happened at schools that I've worked at. So mm -hmm. there's a lot, 
Correct. Would I love it per personally if we had 24 in all the upper grades and 20 in all the lower grades? Absolutely. But then Mr. Trader would be really upset because that number from the red line would absolutely cross that blue line. <laughs> and I also want to add one other part, and I know that uh, this isn't, uh, I spoke to Mrs. Yelsey about this. Uh, it's not uh, the job of the foundations no. to fund our intervention teachers in That's our right. schools. Mm -hmm. So I asked Mr. Trader to put together a plan over the next four or five years how we can then absorb those costs so that our foundations aren't paying for intervention teachers. So it's a, it's a big ask. Mm -hmm. He's gonna, it's gonna take quite a bit. Uh, but uh, that's something we don't want uh, any of our schools having to do is provide intervention programs. Mm -hmm. That's our job as a district. And so he's gonna look at how we can migrate all those costs over to us. Uh, because we should be covering those services. Thank you. Okay, thank if, you. If I may, I, I just wanted to add one thing back to the class size discussion. I, I just want to validate what uh, Dr. Navarro, uh, Mrs. Floor, uh, Ms. Matoy have said, because if Dr. Sir was here, he'd be saying this uh, on our behalf, that this College Park class size issue, we, we analyze that very closely, and that's exactly what you said. Uh, this was uh, a collaboration with the site making some decisions and, and putting the resources more towards the primary grades. In this case, uh, you, you nailed it right on the head, the second grade level. Uh, and with uh, uh, the principal there, uh, uh, Rich Rodriguez, in the intervention program, felt that that was the best resource. And he did that also in conjunction with uh, collaboration with the teachers involved. So that's a very good example of how we work together on staffing and when there is uh, a situation that warrants an added teacher. We have those discussions. I'm part of those discussions and we make the decisions. We go to the uh, Jeff Trader and he's always been <laughs> very supportive when we can justify it based on the numbers. And we do do that on several occasions each and every year. There's a special begging chair that we can sit <laughs> in and say, please, we need one more. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, moving on to consent calendar. All items listed under the consent calendar are considered by the board to be routine and will be enacted by the board in one motion. This includes the consent calendars for business, education services, human resources, student support services, and superintendent. There will be no discussion of these items prior to the time the board votes on the motion unless members of the board, staff, or the public request specific items to be discussed and or removed from the consent calendar. Public requests of items to be discussed and or removed should be submitted in writing prior to the board's consideration of this consent calendar. Move adoption of the consent calendar. Second. Okay, so we have. All in favor? No, oh. she's got to read out. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, the consent calendar is moved by Ms. Matoye and seconded by Ms. Franco. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any uh, no's? Okay, so that passes. Moving on to discussion action calendar, um, Mr. Drake. It's too bad. Um, of course. Uh, uh, <laughs> okay, I do have some friends here. Do you have pom poms or something? To, and, and I promise they uh, they will have a majority of the time. Um, but uh, President Snell, members of the board, Dr. Navarro, uh, I'm extremely excited to be here to mm -hmm. um, recommend approval of the illustrative math materials for our sixth through eighth grade um, math program. Up, oh, I'm going to have to sign mm, in as well. Sign in. I think Mrs. Gailey's getting even with yes. you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Ooh, whoop. <laughs> that came I up. I don't know what's happening there. Mm -hmm. They didn't want anybody to see your password. I know. You may have to change it. Welcome back, ladies. <laughs> nice to see you. Wrong password. <laughs> <laughs> it's made our lives so easy. Only we get hacked. <laughs> which, is, which is why we got a budget book. <laughs> you can put that back with us. You don't mind. Mm. 
Ah, uh, that's going to be a problem. <laughs> we will get there. Yeah, it's forgotten okay. my password. Is what you're supposed to sign that one? <laughs> Where's Awesome? Where's Ryan? Oh, Ryan doesn't have his password. Oh, that's true. John, I'm going to teach you my tech secret. Okay. okay. I asked Vanessa to fix it for me. Yeah. <laughs> Did you get it? Now I need rec I need uh, permission oh, I to my own uh, document, I guess. <laughs> I know. All right, let's see here. Oh. Oh, that's right. <coughs> encouraging. <coughs> Reconnecting. Well, I'm going to carry on. Um, I, I don't necessarily need the slides. If they come up, that'll be great. Um, you could show them in this format. Sure. Let's see here. All can right. Handle that. So you signed me out. <laughs> That's all right. Um, I will wear pink next time and maybe show. <laughs> Anyhow, you've seen this slide before, um, and uh, we really, you know, I, I want to take us back actually two years um, when we actually started our K-5 adoption process because we talked a lot about the actual experience we want kids to start. Um, having with their math program. And our K-5 teachers went through the a similar process that our 6-8 teachers just went through um, and chose a program that was progressive, but uh, a program that could actually allow them to take kids deeper into the mathematical concepts and, and actually achieve the expectations of our um, math program. Part of the process that uh, our 6-8 went through right at the beginning in August is they actually dove into the Bridges materials um, the, the K-5 materials to really understand that experience that kids were going to have in kindergarten through fifth grade and, 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 and that experience that they would be coming to them with in math, really committing to that K-12 experience that, we're, that really is our vision uh, for mathematics. Um, and so that, that along with making sure that the materials were aligned and that they were materials that were going to allow us to deepen, you know, dive deep into the mathematical concepts and, and, and allow kids to gain that understanding, you know, for future math. Um, and they've done an amazing job at that. Um, our very last meeting of the summer, before we really dove into the pilot process and training, we asked teachers this question, and you've seen this before. Um, but, you know, how do they expect to prepare students for a, you know, a quantitative future? Um, uh, and all of the pieces that they came up with really had nothing to do with being able to plug in, you've heard me say this uh, before, plug in numbers to algorithms and get a right answer. But have everything to do with thinking deeply about math, understanding it conceptually, being able to procedurally go through to get answers, but more importantly, they understand it so well that they can apply it. And those were the traits they were looking for in relation to materials so that kids were leaving us with a K-12 experience with a deep understanding of math, right, and an ability to apply it to their lives. That was the, the you know, that is the K-12 experience we're creating with kids. And I'm excited to recommend to you approval of illustrative math materials. And I throw this slide up there because illustrative math materials are the highest rated sixth through eighth grade math materials out there. Um, they are materials that are going to allow us to dive deep into the, into the work for all of our kids. Um, and that's why my friends are behind me because they're the ones who do it and have done it on an, and have that experience. And I want them to share that with you tonight. Good evening. Um, hello, Dr. Snell, uh, President Snell, Dr. Navarro, and board members. My name is Amy Samir. I am a math teacher, seventh, eighth, and math intervention at CDM. So I'm here to tell you a little bit about my experience with IM. Um, it has been a great experience to see a curriculum that is uh, have the coherence from K to 12 and to actually use the students' knowledge that they have learned in elementary, in middle school, and carry on to high school. Um, it's also a well aligned with our standards and frameworks, so that makes it a little bit easier for the teachers to actually focus on the students and on teaching rather than on finding materials to help the students. In my class, we had a lot of aha moments, and the aha moments didn't only come from the students, it only came from, it also came from me. Mm -hmm. um, I had the aha moment of, 
oh, so this is how I can teach this topic in an easier way for the students to understand it. Uh, and for them, there was, oh, so this is how we can actually solve this problem or understand this concept. So there were a lot of aha moments during group work and during the class discussion. Um, in the previous materials, uh, I always got the questions from the students of why are we studying these topics? Why are we doing this? And y you can relate. <laughs> um, in this curriculum, it actually answered the why. It, I didn't get the why from the students. They already knew why. They already um, knew how to explain things. Um, one thing about this curriculum, it's always asking for students' reasoning. It's not asking them to apply as much as it's asking them to, why did you use this method? Why are you following these steps? This is the reasoning behind the concept. And I believe without the reasoning, the students are not gonna understand what they are doing. Um, another thing is I took the liberty of using the material again beyond the piloting six weeks. Um, I have used it recently in um, a unit that for eighth grade. And what I found is that they have used the knowledge that the students have from fourth and fifth grade in finding the area of a triangle and the area of a square to actually find the square root of a number or finding the um, distance between two points. So it's a very cohesive um, uh, curriculum, not only within the grade level, but also throughout their educational um, time. It also, within each unit, it's not, it's not putting the other units aside. They are still using it in every single unit. So in the last unit, they are asking them questions from unit one and unit mm -hmm. two. So it's not saying, okay, you're done with this topic, mm -hmm. it's over. No, it's, you're gonna use it all over. Mm -hmm. And um, this is something that my students were so happy to work with and they were so excited to see the the type of questions that were asked the group work that they um, asked the teachers to put the students in groups and have them discuss the topic and then we discuss it as a whole class um, the curriculum is a great guidance for the teacher to guide the students so even without any teacher on their own can go online read the instructions and um, understand very well how to break down the class and guide the students and it will be very successful. This is Great. my experience. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Hello again. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Stephanie Marvickson. I'm the middle school math TOSA and I'm also a teacher at Costa Mesa Middle School. Um, I had the opportunity this year to pilot with a group of our honor students. Um, and then because this is a free and online <coughs> curriculum, I took advantage and I um, used the materials also for a very good portion of the year um, with students that are coming to our school that are two and three grade levels behind. So I really got to experience the honors level and the, um, the lower level students that are coming in. And what I've realized is that this curriculum is brilliantly written. Um, it really does help students start with a low point of entry so that every student can come in. It really eliminates the fear that a lot of our lower performing students come in and I can't do this, I don't understand it. Um, and starts with problems that really don't have a right answer. It's really like they put up four images and they say which one doesn't belong and there's a reason for all four of them. Mm -hmm. So any student feels comfortable raising their hand and, and talking about what, what they think about the problem. Um, and then the, the high achieving students can go into that same problem and offer this knowledge and they can sort of show what they know at, at a much deeper <coughs> level. But everyone can get into the, into the curriculum. Um, and that's consistent from every lesson to every unit to the whole year. Um, I really found that the students that were starting off the year a few grade levels behind were still ac able to access a lot of the curriculum. And then um, some of the honor students really got stumped on some problems and they got frustrated with it and it made me very happy as their teacher um, because it was challenging enough for them and um, they were more excited when they were able to persevere through those types of problems. 
Um, so one example I have from the lower performing students um, to give you an idea about what this curriculum is about is with a unit on proportions and percents. So percents are typically a topic that middle school students struggle with, even though um, as adults we use them in our everyday life multiple times. Um, and so what the curriculum did is it took out the piece where they had to set up this proportion, where you have one fraction equal to another fraction and then you cross multiply and solve. Um, and what it did instead is help students develop methods using models and diagrams to understand percents how we think about them. So if we wanted to take 40% of a number, we would probably find, sorry, we'd probably find 10% and then multiply it by four. Um, and so the lower performing students really liked this model because once they learned how to find 10% or 1%, they could find any percent. Um, so a lot of these students came to my class without knowing how to multiply. And so if you set up a cross product and they don't know how to multiply, they're never gonna access that content. What they could do is add, and they knew that multiplication was repeated addition. Mm -hmm. And so they set up their chart and they put 10% and they knew they had to find 40%, like a 40% sale, and they did the 10% number and they added it again to find 20%, they added it again for 30%, they added it again for 40%. Now they're able to access the mm -hmm. grade level content. Mm -hmm. Um, and so what the curriculum does is it provides them that model and then it builds and builds and builds so eventually they do get to the cross products but if a student never gets to the cross products that's okay because they have a, a method and they have a strategy that they can use. Mm -hmm. um, this week our school did a end of year diagnostic test and there's a percent problem on it and we haven't really covered percent since October and every one of those low performing students that came in set up a model and a diagram to help them find 40% discount. So that's sort of something that, mm -hmm. that we can use mm -hmm. um, and how we know we can access those kids as well as, as challenge the upper level kids. And this is just written in a way where the coherence and the purposefulness of how they're setting up the problems is really, really cool. Um, it's fun as a teacher, like Amy said, you learn and you grow as a teacher. Like when she's talking about square roots, I did this unit as well with my students. They're actually finding a square root because it's the side length of the area of a square. And a lot of times we don't teach it that way. We mm -hmm. just tell them to memorize something. So mm -hmm. um, the understanding of the why is really important and it's so important for retention and we're finding a lot of retention so far using this program. So we have some quotes about what students said. Um, and they're really tiny, so you'll have to read them. They're really <laughs> small. So the first one says, my greatest experience was continually trying to solve the tough math questions. They were hard, but when I would finish, I had a sense of pride. When I was able to help other people with the math concept, I felt like I succeeded being able to understand the concept. This is because it fills me with joy and power. We're talking about math. <laughs> the, greatest success, <laughs> the greatest success about this program is that sometimes there's a lot of hands-on learning. This helps the class better understand how to answer the questions to the math. I feel my greatest success in this program is learning how to use ratios in everyday life. Using this resource for this unit helped me because it uses many pictures, models, and everyday examples. I now understand how you can use ratios while cooking and shopping. Mm -hmm. oh. I thought that one of my greatest successes was when I could just not get the concept, but I kept trying and trying, and I started to get the hang of it. All of the strategies really helped me. Mm -hmm. So these are from the mouths of 6th, 7th, and 8th wow. graders, yeah. and if they're saying that after one unit, mm -hmm. I can't imagine what they're going to think at the end of the year. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So with that being said, I highly recommend um, <laughs> illustrative math to you for approval uh, as our 6th uh, six, six through 8th grade uh, math instructional materials. Okay, uh, Mrs. Floor. Uh, thank you, and I, I am thrilled, but I, I just have a sort of, it's, I have a 7th grader at Corona Del Mar who has been going through the process, and of course, I have a son-in-law who's a manufacturing engineer, and he's like, like what? I know this answer, I can't figure this out. And it was staying up all night to try and figure it out. The question I have is, I mean, in the old days it was rote memorization. And so is some of the frustration that our high, 
our high learners are learning is because they're so used to being compliant and getting, knowing that, you know, this is the way to do it. I've memorized this. Why can't I, you know, I don't understand why I have to explain this because I've memorized. Is that, are you finding that that's part of the, 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 the frustration that our, our high end achieving are, they're just not able to, to really delve deep into the program because I know the I know the formula. I know how to get, I know how to get the square root. I know how to do this. I don't right. under, you know don't ask me about everything else. <laughs> yeah. Well, just to assure you, I am a former electrical engineer, so I know exactly <laughs> where he's coming from. <laughs> I know exactly where he's coming from. And yes, um, the way we were taught, I was taught, and others were taught is here's the form formula, memorize it, and you're done. Mm -hmm. But what we have found over the years is that yes, kids memorize the formula, by the time they get out of my class, they don't remember the formula. Mm -hmm. So this is the, hopefully this is what we are trying to get them to do, is that they remember how to develop the formula and how to actually come down to a way that it doesn't have to be the formula in front of them to solve the problem. They can use the reasoning and they can use their previous knowledge that they have been learning from kindergarten to solve um, a complicated problem. Again, this brings us back to the square root. They, they didn't teach them that you have to take the square root. They taught them find the area of a square and then find the length of the sides of a square and this is gonna be your square root. So it's, it's not about the formula memorization mm -hmm. as much as do you understand how to you develop the formula mm -hmm. and how to use what you know already to answer a question? And I believe at the beginning of the year, I saw one of the slides in one of the professional developments saying that the market for hiring has changed. Mm -hmm. It's no longer the computation that they are looking for. It's they are looking for somebody to come up with new ideas and somebody to invent new things. Um, and this is what we are trying to take our kids to. It's not computing on a computer because computers now, as you can see, Are even, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> even though it glitches sometimes, but it still can um, give you the answer with a right. click of a button. And the, the business owners and CEOs do not want that. They want somebody to actually develop something. And this is what we are trying to take our kids to. So the big question is, uh, I guess from my point of view, is how are we going to communicate this to the parents. How are we going to tell our parents? <laughs> you know, that what guess what? <laughs> it's a new day and you all have so to go back to school too. Vanessa's <laughs> going to be very proud of me when I refer to the LCAP. <laughs> um, we Either did write that into our plan of making sure that um, we are getting out into the community and holding uh, parent community nights. Um, we will make an official notice that we will have our first one um, on the 18th of this month with Patrick Callahan at Newport Harbor High School from 6.30 to 8 o'clock mm -hmm. to start getting this word out, both mm -hmm. from a, you know, um, um, a K-12 perspective as well as from a, from a college perspective mm -hmm. down. And can that be, can that, that be filmed? that will happen several times throughout these next couple of so months. So can we film that? Can we have that filmed? Is there a way well, to get that filmed? We can ask to see if our, if our, uh, our stage crew is available. So that, that at the very least, somebody could access it online and, and it'd be on our website. Have that, him come another night, too. Well, well but well, again, there's some people may not he, be able to, but if we'll we We'll have him come out several different times so that we're covering all the zones and all of the schools. I really yeah. do. I think it's just as hands-on for our kids, you know, our students, it's and our, our teachers, you know, for our teachers to learn as well. As I think our parents need it our as well. I think it. they, after doing a couple in the district, because um, I know that's how I learn. Mm -hmm. You know, I need to see great. it. And yeah. I think they've been very successful. Sorry to. Oh, that's okay. You, Mrs. Yelsey. Uh, yes. I really appreciate the way you went about this with consensus. I think that's a great way to come, come up with what program we're using. And I know that the seventh and eighth grade teachers were probably more supportive than the sixth grade teachers initially coming into this, at least. That was what I heard from some sixth grade teachers. You're looking at me like, no? I don't know what you mean by supportive. What do you mean by um, that? 
they were not quite as comfortable with illustrative math as maybe the seventh and eighth. That's my un that's what I've heard from some from some teachers. So, is it because these teachers math is their background? They know it, and it's easier for them to teach. And if so, uh, sixth grade teachers probably are math is not their strong suit for most of them. What kind of supports are we going to need to give to those teachers to help them along with this program? Yeah, so quite a bit. Um, but I think it's all teachers. I mean, I think when, when you hear, you know, veteran teachers or electrical, electrical engineers saying, I'm even discovering things through this <laughs> curriculum, I think all of our teachers are going to need support to recognize how, how to use these materials to take kids to the, to the depth of understanding that, that the, the standards are expecting us to. Um, I, I want to kind of go back to that sixth grade initial comment. Um, I, all I can share with you is, and unfortunately we don't have Alice Formanek or Stephanie Lakin here tonight, they were invited um, to share that sixth grade perspective, um, but the commitment to that K-12 experience was the conversation. Um, and while sixth grade teachers, at least in some of the small groups during consensus that I was part of, um, in listening to them, they got to the point where they recognized, yeah, this is going to be better for kids to make sure that we are connecting to the middle school. Um, as far as, as supports, uh, we will definitely run moonlight sessions for teachers who want that before units. We are also going to be working with illustrative math because part of their business model is really to provide the PD behind um, the, the incredible materials to um, regularly do pre-unit um, training for teachers um, and we're also looking at embedding the model within the work that they do. Um, not pulling them out for a day and training them, but doing that within their planning time and so forth, um, you know, on, on different days. Okay. So there will be, it'll be extensive. Okay. Okay, Ms. Matoye. Will that, that was my sorry, button pushing, um, will that include a summer program like we had with the elementary teachers? Yes, we're, we're ironing out the dates right now, but we will definitely have two days of, of I'm going to say, optional summer training for them to attend before the two days or before the, the August return. And then for those teachers that can't make that time, we will have two days during the August return. Perfect. And my second question was to our fabulous teachers. How did you find the assessments? Were they aligned? Did they... Um, they're tall, John. <laughs> the assessments were um, aligned to the standards. So some of the authors that worked on illustrative math were the same authors of the standards. And so when they wrote the curriculum, they had that in mind. Um, all of the assessments are seven questions. Hmm. Um, there's a pre-unit pre before every unit to give a teacher a diagnostic, and it has like third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade prior knowledge content as well as content that's in the unit. So the teacher can take that information and decide where do my students need more support and where can I go a little faster. Um, and then there are sometimes mid-unit and always end-of-unit assessments that are seven questions. And they have that same philosophy of they start with problems that all kids can access and then they get to the really, really deep questions. So <coughs> questions one, two, and three are, are somewhat um, fac factual and do they know the processes and do they understand the basic concepts? And then as the questions, as you get further down into the test, that question seven is usually a really big mm -hmm. application problem where they're mixing um, multiple content um, mm -hmm. ideas together um, and multiple course things together. But I really like the assessments. They're, they're, they're really, they're well written because you can tell where a student lies on their continuum of their knowledge. So if a student's getting one, two, and three right and then they miss the rest of them, they only got this far. But if a student's mastering question seven, they're above they're above the standard on on this topic. So I think I think they're very well written. Are they paper pencil or online? They are paper pencil. Um, they are paper pencil. We're using um, Learnzillion has an online platform, um, and it's not up and running yet. But what they have said is the students can enter the answers um, online, and they use the same applets that the CASP test uses, the SBAC uses, so the students will be used to answering mm -hmm. qu test questions the same way. And then the teachers can actually, because those are scored as like a short answer, short response, constructed response, the teachers can type in their own rubric for how they want to score it, and then mm -hmm. it'll calculate the score and we can see oh the data. 
that way. Um, so it'll automatically score the ones that have sort of one right or wrong answer, and then those open-ended ones, the teachers get to type in their own rubric and score it. It's again more challenging, but the data that you get would be so much more useful. Yes. And, and faster to gather it all together. And then hopefully we can do some district-wide analysis and things like that. Okay. Do we Great. need a motion? Yes, we do. I move that we ad approve the illustrative mathematics at grade six through eight as the sixth grade six through eight instructional math materials. That was second. Okay. Good job. Thank you. Okay, so um, there's a motion to approve illust oh, no. illustrative mathematics um, made by Ms. Matoye and seconded by Mrs. Floor. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <laughs> Okay, hey, we have wonderful. Math next year. Yay. Yay. Thanks for Ooh, coming. Woo, and they can get that right now. Coming. Thank you. They can get the materials right now. Front. Oh, the materials. John's up again. They can access okay. materials right now. They can right access away? materials right now, correct? Mr. Uh, Drake. Teachers can. Teachers can. Well, just in case you wanted a break this summer. Thanks so much for um, staying. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you for staying too and oh, coming well. back oh, to wait, the podium. But wait, there's more. coming back. But wait, there's more. There's more. Yeah, of course. Go ahead. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, Mr. Drake. So I am going to ask uh, Caroline to come back on up um, uh, to help us with this one. But uh, just as discussion action, we we have or we were in a, about the beginning of April approached by Illustrative Math um, to for our high school uh, um, courses to, to to be a beta pilot district for their high school materials that they've developed. Um, and that was prior to uh, even our middle school committing to illustrative math. We were towards the end of our process, but they had not yet committed. So at that point, I convened the, the high school steering committee and threw the option out to them. Um, and once again, they went right to kind of that August date uh, when they made the decision to step away from piloting and going through an adoption process this year so that they could connect to whatever decisions um, six through eight were, were what was going to make. Um, so in April, when I approached them with this, they said yes. Um, there was there was really um, uh, you know conversation uh, around that idea of we stepped away because of this K-12 experience. We have the opportunity to potentially get there, especially if six eight chooses illustrative math, um, and so they were in. So we are entering into this next school year, um, and we will spend the entire school year uh, in a pilot process with the Illustrative Math High School materials um, only um, this mm -hmm. next year. And that was another conversation I had with them. I said, you know, what if they're not up to, to what, what we mm -hmm. need? Mm -hmm. um, and their response at that point was, you know, it's worth it if we can actually, you know, make that connection. And if not, then we're committing to another year of pilot after that. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, there it, it, it's a little bit of a gamble other than, as um, Stephanie mentioned, the uh, authors of these materials are the authors of our, our standards. Um, I'm pretty confident sure. that they're going to be aligned. Um, that doesn't mean that there won't need to be some tweaks uh, to them. Um, but I think it's one of those opportunities that our teachers saw, and I'll let Carolyn take over from here, um, as one that they, they just could not pass up. I'm short too. <laughs> okay. Hi. Hi. Hello again, President Snell, Dr. Navarro, members of the board. Nice to see you again. Um, yeah, I'm just picking up where John left off. Mm -hmm. The high school teachers are really excited about this. Um, it was a hard decision, I can't tell you, mm -hmm. to wait another year because we've been waiting too mm -hmm. um, for the publishers to finally produce something that is actually aligned to the standards. And mm -hmm. um, the hope and the excitement about the illustrative math curriculum at the high school level. I mean, we're just so excited to see what they come up with at the high school, or at the, sorry, at the middle school level. Mm -hmm. We're so excited to see what they come up with for high school. Mm -hmm. um, seeing uh, Bill McCallum, who's one of the authors of the curriculum and one of the authors of the standards, speak about this in November at a conference we went to, he showed us some examples from the curriculum, and I mean, it looks fantastic. And so I just can't wait to get, I honestly can't wait to get my hands on it. <laughs> and um, the steering committee, you know, feels the same way. The, the opportunity to give it ago was just too great and one that we just couldn't really afford to miss because um, we really are committed as a group to that k-12 experience we're tired of students having fragmented math experiences mm -hmm. coming to us from different mm -hmm. different experiences at different levels and so knowing now that you know a couple years down the road they're going to be coming to us from having bridges and then having illustrative math 
you know, we want to continue that really rich mathematics um, education. Mm -hmm. And as a high school teacher, I'm just really excited to finally go as deep as I've always wanted to go. Mm -hmm. At the high school level in previous years, we've always had to spend a lot of time filling in gaps. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, the hope is, and I feel pretty confident that uh, we'll have, le have less time devoted to that in the future, and mo more time really devoted to the like rich mathematical modeling tasks that the standards actually call for the students to uh, perform and perform at a very high level. And so it's exciting. It's an exciting yes. time to be a math teacher in our district. And um, so, yeah, that's it. Miss <laughs> Matoye. So my understanding of this, as it is clearly written, that this is a beta test. Correct. So that means our teachers yes. will be the ones that be able to provide the input to the publisher. So whereas when we're piloting, it's like, well, this is what we get. Do we, can, how do we adapt to it? But we can say, you know what, this is great. Yeah. But if you did, could you put this chapter in here and this chapter there, and it'll be more seamless. So that's kind of, it's, it's a responsibility, but mm -hmm. it's also exciting because we're going to help make it wonderful. It is, and they're a very um, adaptive organization, Illustrative Math. I forget the exact percentage. John might remember it, but I think it was around 25% uh, of the middle school curriculum was adjusted in response to feedback from wow. their beta pilot. Wow. Um, so we will have that opportunity. It's also a privilege to be part of it. Mm -hmm. I have um, teacher friends in other districts that are like, oh, you, got, you guys get to do that? That's so cool. You know, we applied, we didn't get it, or whatever. And um, so, yeah, so it's I exciting. I like the envy of somebody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is floor. Yeah, um, I've got the open up uh, contract here. And it says Algebra 1, Geometry, and Algebra 2. And I know that this is a sensitive topic, but um, the question I have is because we don't have Algebra 1, so Geometry, hard, yeah. and Algebra 2. We have what's called integrated math. And so, John, could you explain how this, how this is going to roll out? Yes, with a pilot, I can. Please? So the, the materials as they've designed them at this point are in the traditional sequence, Algebra 1, Geometry, and Algebra 2. Um, we spent time as a steering committee because they were giving us the option um, to go ahead and spend our time, and it would have been a lot of time, rearranging into an integrated pathway. Um, uh, Jake Haley and I actually were able to meet with Bill McCollum <coughs> when we were in Washington, D.C. at the National Conference and talk to him about that. Um, and while he said you could do it, um, one of his concerns would have been, or was, and it was a major concern, he said, would be that if we were to do that, it, the, the, the coherence of the program, the story of the math that the program tells is, is at stake. Um, and we talked some more and, and got to the point, um, you, and the steering committee got here as well, where does it make more sense for us right now to pilot the materials as originally written? and okay. spend more of our time this year in the pilot focusing on instruction because regardless of what materials we have, we need to really focus on empowering our teachers to take kids deeper in their mathematical thinking and build their own content knowledge. Um, and so that was the, the ultimate decision of, of the, the steering committee was, let's not mess with the materials, let's beta pilot them as, as written. Um, if they're good enough, Probably January we'll start that conversation again of are these going are these looking like they're going to be the materials we use and if so what do we want to do next as far as um, you know uh, staying integrated or moving you know to a to a traditional path uh, uh, sequence um, the the pilot itself so the design of the pilot is to make sure that every ninth grader math one student is in is part of the pilot so all of our ninth graders will pilot. There's a, there's a need to have some math three classes pilot so that we can see how the, the materials can support then a, a you know, fourth year of math for kids. Um, and so that's, that's the design at this point of our pilot. So basically what you're saying, still have math one, two, and three for the, for the, on the report card and on progress reports, it'll be math one, two, and three. But you're going to communicate to the parents that they're going to be having, it's going to be Algebra 1, Geometry, Algebra 2. We're not doing is that? So our, our Math 2 you're class. You're only doing, you're doing first, you're doing we're ninth doing all grade. all ninth grade. Which is Algebra 1. And select Math 3. Okay, so we're only, we're starting really slow in other words. Correct. We're starting with just And we would ninth. roll in if we decide to go that way. Okay, okay. 
And so again, how are we communicating this with parents? We will, we will hold parent communication nights and we will also get uh, information out in writing to all freshmen and uh, as we've done in all of our pilots, making sure parents are aware that their kids are participating in a pilot and this is what's happening in the pilot. And then enhanced math, um, the higher level math, how is that addressed in, in, the, in the program? Do you wanna address that? So for the pilot, um, the reason for the design, because originally, as middle school did this year, not everybody would, would pilot, just certain select teachers would pilot, because it's, it's a big time commitment. But we realized with um, the traditional, the materials being traditional, it's being immigrate, integrated, the only way that we could do this pilot is if every math one student took Algebra one, okay. because then next year they can take geometry. And so even if, say worst case scenario, which I don't think is gonna happen, Materials are terrible, we hate them. We have one cohort of students who gets you know, a geometry next year and we continue with our integrated sequence with everybody else. So their, their math story in high school hasn't been disrupted. We wanted to make sure that they cover all the standards um, in a cohesive way. Um, so that, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm so sorry, I forgot your question. <laughs> About the, the, the higher level. The, oh, the higher the, level, the, so the enhanced, enhanced level. Math so as I think Stephanie, actually, both Stephanie and Amy kind of alluded to, the materials have what's called a low floor and a very, very high ceiling. Um, so it is totally feasible with the same set of materials to reach students who are below grade level and are also ready to you know, jump above grade level. The materials just have those supports built in. And so there's sections in the materials called like, are you ready for more? Things like that where an enhanced level class could easily take that next step. Um, something that I've learned a lot in recent years um, through this pilot process and attending these conferences, talking to people like Bill McCallan, is really the enhanced pathway isn't necessarily designed <coughs> to go faster it's designed, it should be designed to go deeper. And that's not something that I don't, I don't know how well we've achieved that to this point. And so I think these materials give us an opportunity to really do that with our enhanced kids. Great. Thank you. Any more, any more questions? Um, no. Okay. Uh, move approval <coughs> of the beta pilot memo of understanding with open up resources for high school math instructional materials. Second. Second. Third. Third. Fourth. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, we have uh, it moved by Ms. Floor and seconded by Mrs. Yelsey. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so it carries. Congratulations again. Yay. Thank you so much for your help. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's great. Okay, I feel better. On to 20 point C, um, and this is Dr. Diagostino. <laughs> Good evening, President Snell, Vice President Matoy, board members, Dr. Navarro, and cabinet. As you know, uh, the district has been using the Titan Emergency Notification System for our high schools for the past three years. We've been really impressed with its performance. Tonight, we're asking you to approve an amended memorandum of understanding that's going to expand the use of Titan not only to all the schools in the district, but we're going to be using it with all our divisions and departments as well as our district brand standard for an emergency notification system. Between students, parents, teachers, and staff, we anticipate that Titan will be serving approximately 90,000 contacts mm. uh, throughout the district. We've asked the CEO, Vic Merjanian, um, to come in. A as you know, it's really great when you can have the company's CEO come in, but more importantly, he is a CDM alum. <laughs> we always like to point that out. He's here to give you a brief presentation on what Titan has done for the district and what it's going to be doing uh, as you consider approval for tonight's MOU. So Vic, come on up. Okay. Oh, let me uh, set you up here. So. No. Can he access his best card? <laughs> right. There you go, sir. Ooh. Thanks so much. Good evening, all. How is everyone doing tonight? I know Good. it's getting late in the evening. <laughs> it but, uh, is. We'll try and make this fun and, and rather quick. Okay. So uh, a little bit about me. Titan HST is, uh, let me go back here. So a little bit about me, I am from CDM, I'm a product of Newport Mesa, 
And you know, I actually have no idea what the presentation before me was about. This is the first time I've heard of it. But <laughs> it's something that's really great. And I think that's one of the things that makes NMUSC so innovative. Mm -hmm. And you know, when we're, when we're building these systems and we're working on these things, it's so funny because this system was actually built by a group of us from UCSD and my best friend from CDM. <laughs> and I go back to the story when I was at CDM. We had Mr. Gear in ninth grade bio. And everyone back then was stippling. And we took digital arts class with Ms. Brudnick. And back then, the computers, I mean, they barely had digital <coughs> arts. And Mr. Gear said, you know, instead of stippling, what if you guys used cameras to digitally capture? And back then, digital cameras, there were no, I mean, just to give you guys an idea, that there were no color cell phones. Digital cameras, I mean, were barely in existence. I think they held like 16 pictures. <laughs> and so we used to go, and we took all the stuff we learned in digital arts, we applied it through the technology of the cameras, we went into those bio classes. We probably spent four times as much time in the bio class as anyone else. <laughs> but we took everything digitally, and then we went back to the digital arts class, and we applied that knowledge. And from that, years later in law school, I created a uh, paperless law review. We're the first in the nation to have that, so applied those skills again. We took that, then we, we built Titan. And so when you guys take a look at the, you know, the, the people who are here before me, and looking at kind of taking information and applying it, computers can so easily these days process data. But it's very difficult to have analytical thinking and things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And so I really encourage you guys, it was really exciting to see something like that. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I kind of digress a little bit. So with Titan HST, you know, we are rooted in CDM. This is a community that we really care about. We have dozens of interns that come through us. Uh, whenever, you know, when there was a threat at CDM, I personally went there to see what I could do to help out. We've got multiple scholarships at NMUSD. We really, really care about the community. And kind of the sad reality of where things are at, we're here today at an educational event, right? This is a board meeting. We're not in Afghanistan. We're not in Iraq. We're not in a prison. Mm -hmm. and, and who do we have standing here, sitting right next to us? <laughs> a gentleman mm -hmm. with a gun. Mm -hmm. Is the math book going to attack us? <laughs> I mean, this, this is the reality of where we're at, mm -hmm. you know? And so the thing is, when you've got a situation like this, mm -hmm. you've got to have something that is purpose-built and driven because seconds matter. In the last year alone, our system was used 62 million times wow. in the US alone. And we are trusted by the largest higher ed organizations in the whole country. We have marquee US landmarks that we secure. Private sector, it's dime a dozen these days. And with the public sector and government as well, after going through ridiculous RFPs and repetitive <laughs> processes and et cetera, every time you know, we talk to the government sector, they always tell us, Vic, you know, we're only seven shootings away from out of our sight from making a decision. You know? <laughs> and that's kind of the reality of the market. But the thing is, if you look at FBI statistics, two thirds of emergencies end before emergency personnel receive, or, or arrive. And so when you're looking at that statistic, the person who's going to save you or save you is the person outside who is able to initiate a lockdown fast enough that you can barricade the door mm -hmm. or get out. Mm -hmm. Because as fast as the police are, they will not get here quickly enough to do anything. And at the sites where there were police, including Columbine and some of the more recent shootings, they were not able to stop the shootings. And so the reality is there are these incidents. And again, while we talk about shootings, 40% of the use of our system is medically related, yeah. including at NMUSD sites. These include things from heart attack, stroke, food allergy, diabetic shock, broken bones. I mean, the list goes on and on and mm -hmm. on. And so your best bet is not to have a Swiss Army knife that's yay big with 17 attachments in there. If you've got a situation where it's war on your site, you need to have the strongest weapon you have against that. And that's quick information that gets disseminated within seconds so that you know what's going on. And I'm going to get into the technology of that in a moment. So what have we done that's different? Now, there are products on the market that are a one-way push notification, right? It doesn't take a scientist to have a one-way push notification. The problem is, with a one-way push notification, first of all, you have to get that information up the food chain. So if you are a teacher or a student in the quad, if you're out on the PE field, if you're out on the football field, if you're in a classroom where the teacher blew a disc and the whole front office is gone because it's lunch, and they couldn't call anyone in the front office, mm -hmm. how are you getting that information up there? With Titan, you have two-way communication. So that's the first piece of it. Not only do you have the two-way communication, but we are also grabbing location data, but we don't track anyone in the background. So only if and when you need help, we know where you are and we know where to send help. And that's really kind of the key. So on the push notification side, we're able to outperform the other systems that are out there 
two thirds of the sites that come to us come from competitor systems after they failed in an emergency. And the reason why that's significant is when you send out a push notification and two thirds of emergencies end before emergency responders arrive, when it takes you minutes, hours, or days to go through, one of the competitor sites that had a deployment tried to send out a few hundred push notifications and another one a couple thousand. It took hours to days to go through. They called the manufacturer and the, this company, and, and this is a company you guys know as well at this district, said, well, yeah, that's a lot of notifications. Well, great, what are you gonna do when there's an emergency and it's at a site that has more than 30 users? Yeah. Our system during the California Great Shakeout every fall is used in this state alone by every site at the same time and maintains a throughput of seconds. Mm -hmm. And that's what you've got because, excuse the French, but when there's an emergency, shit hits the fan. And if you think people are tweeting and messaging quickly during a football game, wait till there's a shooting. Wait till there's a drill. You should yeah. see what happens during the drill. People start calling our office when there's a drill and the site hasn't notified parents. Oh. So the thing is, you've got to have this two-way communication with something that's going to work quickly. With augmented reality, and I'll show you guys what that looks like, you can actually flip the phone up. This is technology that Apple is basically hedging on pretty largely at the moment. We deployed this one year before Apple deployed this. Hmm. And what it does is it lets you flip up your phone like a camera, <laughs> and through the camera, so you can see the camera, and you can see people floating through that. So if you've got a building, the 200 building is being shot at, you know right now schools are painting numbers on top of buildings so they know what the building is, or they're like, where are people? You can flip your camera phone up, scan through the building, see where people are huddled at what altitude, what floor, and what corner, and tell the SWAT team to come in from that side or this side. You can see who's injured and who's not. Hmm. That's the kind of technology we have, the eyes and ears. And you know what? You don't need some special hardware. Who here doesn't have an iPhone or an Android phone? That's all you need. Hmm. Now, of course, the system is also accessible via text message, email, phone, web, all that stuff. But if you have an iPhone or an Android phone, we've got that level of technology that's built in in the palm of your hand. So with safety check-in, with these push notifications, you can see what's going on, you can find people and you know how to respond. Real-time translation. This site has many sites. There are a lot of people who don't speak English as a primary language. Again, seconds count. There's no time to figure out what's going on. So we use computer-aided, computer-assisted translation. So you can message me in English, I'll get it in Spanish, the person next to me will get it in Chinese, Vietnamese, they can respond back in Vietnamese, mine will come to English, yours will go to Spanish, et cetera. Hmm. It's computer generated, so I'm not here to tell you it's 100%, but if you say run, I'll get run, sprint, jog, something like that, you'll get the idea, you better get out of where you're at, you know? Yeah. And that's the power of this communication platform. <laughs> it's redundant and secure. So again, there have been sites that have used other systems at NMUSD, one of them there was a power outage. One of them was just a drill. They tried to send out notifications. They failed. They did not go out. With our system, we have geo-redundant infrastructure. We have servers up in multiple regions at the same time. This is very costly to do, but that's what we do so that if there's an emergency, no technology is 100%. But I'll, what I'll tell you is what we've done is so above and beyond what anyone else has done that if this system doesn't work, you better get on your knees and pray because God's the only person who's going to save you after that. <laughs> And that's what we've done. Secure, again, people are always worried about data security. Mm -hmm. We're independently audited by the same companies that audit the CIA and the FBI for data integrity. That's the level. So as much as we've got an educational setting here, and not to minimize the sensitivity of that, we also have diplomats, police officers, politicians, et cetera, in the system. So the system has been safeguarded for the level. Mm -hmm. We did a pilot a couple of years ago with the European Commission. So that's the level with, and you know, we're in discussions with them now. So that's the level of data security that we realize. I mean, you're talking about state affairs. Let me talk about privacy centric. We don't sell your information. We're not a Facebook. When we gather it, we only gather what we need. First name, last name, email, phone number, just what we need to get in touch with you. And a role type. Are you an admin, a student, a parent? You guys probably don't want a student locking down the site. You know, it would be a lot more effective than the old school fire alarm, but you know, we don't allow that. Mm -hmm. Mesh networking. So we've already done a whole bunch of really cool things to make sure that the data goes through in an emergency. You know if you're ever at a concert or a football game and you send a text message and it just kind of sits at the end and it doesn't, you don't get that little satisfying loop where it goes through? So what we do is we sit on that and we monitor that. So if it's not going through, we we'll let you cancel it out. We compress data locally. We do everything we can to push the data through because our servers can get it, but sometimes your networks get overloaded. Or at some of your sites, even when there's no emergency, there's no network connectivity. So what we've done is we've done everything possible to make this work <laughs> over cellular and Wi-Fi. But wait, there's more, and you don't even have to pay shipping and handling for this part. <laughs> <laughs> Double. With mesh networking, 
and this is coming out at the end of this month, if everything has gone black, power has gone out, cell towers are down, you're in some, you know, The Rock is in the movie, Denzel Washington's in this movie. Okay. You know, you've got Arnold Schwarzenegger gearing up. The devices will be able to talk to each other directly via mesh networking. It's like walkie-talkies, oh, except wow. connecting directly. And those work in a range of 30 to 1,000 feet. And so each device, if you're 30 feet from me, and then Ms. Floor is another 1,000 feet from you, it connects to her. If she's 1,000 feet from Ms. Yelsey, it'll connect See to her. Counts. And you'll continue to daisy chain across the entire site infinitely. And so a place that's a school that's very densely populated is the perfect scenario for actually even during a football game where the networks might be overloaded and this system will work. So that's the level of technology that's built into there. Our system has multiple patents on it. We've actually invented, that's again why I'm so excited about what you guys are doing with math. The sciences, they teach you how to build, the arts teach you what to build. And if you don't have that creative thinking, you're never gonna think of how to do things differently. And this is what difference means. We saved our first life within 20 minutes of deployment at a site. So that's what technology and innovation means. Again, we talked about instant throughput, but the other thing I wanna talk about, it's not just the servers that are reliable, they've been designed, and again, this goes back to those math lessons we were talking about. So you take a look and you, you make kind of a car analogy, right? And so you've got maybe if two cylinder engines are powerful, four is better, if four is good, six is better, if six is great, eight is wonderful, you know? Except then you've gotta build a gas station at your house at some point. Yeah. <laughs> so what are all these cars doing these days, right? They're putting turbos on their superchargers because you've gotta maintain the power and you need more power without infinitely larger engines. So that's what we've done with our server infrastructure without getting into all the patented technology. We've built a system that is more intelligent and intelligently and algorithmically processes data because you've gotta go from zero to 100% load. It's not like a Facebook or a Netflix where every Friday night you have a certain level of load. Either no one's on it, it's like flies. You got one or two or, yeah. or you know, there, there's a bunch, everyone's on there. And so that's the kind of stuff we've done that we can tell the difference between a denial of service attack where someone's trying to hack the system versus an actual legitimate growth curve on there. And that's, at the end of the day, this is all you know, magic on the back end, but that's why it works in an emergency. We've already mentioned two thirds of our educational contracts from competitor systems after failure during an actual emergency. And again, I wanna clarify, even though there's all this wonderful stuff, we're accessible via the app and admins should have the app, it's highly recommended. But if you don't have the app, everything, you can do almost everything except raising an emergency alert, saying I need help. You can do everything else. You can get broadcast messages, lockdown notifications, safety check-in, all that stuff comes via text message, email, phone calls. So, I mean, you don't have to have the app. And the really cool thing about all of this too is there's always new technology that we're deploying every couple of weeks and it's all included, so you don't have to do anything. The same way you go to bed, you wake up in the morning and the new app is installed. It doesn't look any different, but <laughs> yeah. there's new functionality in there. And if you text message, if people don't have the app and they get this text messages, or if you send it from the web, when those people text message back, it comes in directly into your app or on the web portal. So you've got all the comments in one place. If you send out a safety status request, say, where are you, are you guys safe? They can text back one for safe, two for not safe, and then they get another link, and then they can plot their location with a click. So again, if you got a flip phone. And we always get asked about adoption at the sites. We've been at NMUSD for several years now. Does anyone want to take a venture, take a guess in all the years we've been here, how many people have asked to be removed from the system? In all the years we've been here. One parent of the year, one year. That's it. I thought so, it was Dana. <laughs> <laughs> so we've had phenomenal acceptance of the system. Right. We strongly encourage it only for emergency communication use. It can do more, obviously, but you start spamming people, they unsubscribe, and then the That's sites right. go, well, these people didn't get it. Well, yeah, because you sent them you know, 16 messages about the bake sale, and nobody yeah. wants of that. You know, right. So exactly. emergency communication. The other cool thing is, because of the contracts, and again, just like we don't use your guys' name, I won't use the name of the sites, but these are some of the largest higher ed uh, college systems in the, in the nation. We went through the ringer with them on, on visually and hearing impaired mm -hmm. um, functionality. So our system operates at the most high level of that. Even other systems and other apps and other platforms that this district uses, if you take a look at their accessibility documents, everything says exception, 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 exception. Ours doesn't say that. It's compliant with everything. So it's fully accessible for everyone, not only from a language standpoint, but from a hearing and visually as well. Not only is the system accessible with the high contrast, the voiceover and all that stuff, but it's accessible in different ways. If you've got at and or T-Mobile, you can have a phone call with two or three, maybe six people on the call at the same time. If you're gonna use your FaceTime on your iPhone to video chat, it does it with one person. We do 50 simultaneous video chats at a time per message 
you can have as many messages as you want. 200 simultaneous audio calls per message, as many messages as you want. Mm -hmm. So people who are deaf can sign language through our app. Oh. Mm -hmm. People who are hard of seeing can use the voiceover and then audio or video. So again, it's about reaching as many people as we can as, in many ways as we can. And we never stop because we're a tech company. It's different. <laughs> video medicine is coming out at the end of this year. So what that will do is we're partnering with some of the largest medical institutions in the country along the East Coast. We've got some of the most well-known Ivy League schools and we're working with their hospitals. Along the West Coast, some of the largest local hospital systems. Can't publicly disclose their names yet, but when I tell you guys, you'll be like, yeah, obviously. Um, you know, it's very well known. And what we're doing with that is so if you guys opt in and there's an emergency at a site, your PE coach or your secretary no longer has to play MD they will be connected into actual MDs and nurse practitioners wow. that alleviates liability from you guys, and it brings in video medicine and accessibility in a way that is otherwise not accessible. Mm. Yeah. And what we're doing with that, we're also going to be adding hardware down the road on that, and so there will be more and more things that we can do with the system. We also have eye beacons coming out later on in the year. Those are little fist-sized sensors you can put in each room. They're passive. They work on batteries that last multiple years. We're adding intelligent features into them from integrating carbon monoxide and smoke detection into that. So if there's an emergency, you know which rooms to respond to first because you know which one's on fire. We're also incorporating gunshot detection into those systems as well too. So you'll know generally where those are coming from. There's more and more technology. We're always racing. We're always pushing the bar to get further and better. NMUSD. Now this is, our system is privacy centric. So the data gets deleted every 90 days unless you guys pull it and, and archive it. And so we can only kind of see what's at a high level. This is just the things that have been communicated to me and or that we can see from a high level by looking at the logs ahead of this meeting. During the last 90 days, NMUSD has had multiple SOSs where people raised an alert. And they had, there were stranger issues, there were gas smells, medical issues, fires, drugs, and drug overdose issues at NMUSD sites. I'm sure there's more. This is just what we've been told about and what we've seen over the last, this is just the last 90 days. Um, safety check-in requests, there's been multiple safety check-in requests. People are trying to find where people were, you know, during emergencies or you know, some might have been drills. Broadcast messages, multiple regarding drills, fire threats, evacuations, giving directions, strangers, warning people, sending a picture, telling people, hey, watch out for this person. Emergency materials, site after site has loaded emergency materials. So when there's an emergency, they've got everything from rosters to site maps to contact information. And if they need to, they can quickly click on that digitally and send it out to everyone, whether they have the app or not. So you're mobilizing your sites like that. Chat groups, what a lot of sites have done, and this is how it's intended to be used, is they've created, for example, a safety team. So it's always sitting there. And the cool thing with Titan, unlike a text message, you don't need people's phone numbers. So it works over both cellular and Wi-Fi and without sharing all the phone numbers. I'm sure you guys <coughs> want to give everyone your phone number, but to the extent you don't, you don't need to do that with this system. Well, that's great. So that's the level of technology that's here. And again, your sites have other options and they've had other options and there's been a wait list over the last year and a half, particularly in the K through six levels where they said, hey, the high schools, the middle schools have it. Why can't we get it? Yeah. And so there's, I think there's a level of excitement that you know, will be adopted well. So what I want to do is I want to show you guys real fast what the system looks like in action. If you take a look at the screen on the left, this is a screen that everyone has access to. We can customize the icons per site per what you guys want. These are just some standard icons. So you select shooter, and then you select send alert. That's it. It grabs your GPS location and says, I'm here. I need help. Whoever's an admin, whoever's a security personnel, if you have SROs, and NMUSD does have SROs on the system, they receive it as well. And then you get bumped to that second screen. Do you want to chat? Do you want to do an audio call or a video call? That's it. You don't need an instruction manual. We used to teach the kids how to use it. They wouldn't pay attention because they already know how to use it. <laughs> so, you know, it's easier than, than any other app that's out there. Are there any questions on this slide? Basically, the goal when we built the system was to not need an instruction manual. Good. <laughs> this is what augmented reality looks like, by the way. That's a room with fire. That's you seeing through the fire and seeing where people are and who's safe and who needs help. That's what you could do. So if you're at CDM and someone approaches, the police department approach from Newport Beach Police, and they're in the parking lot and they're staging. They can stand there and scan. They'll pick up their phone and they'll go like this. And they'll be able to see at a distance what buildings, what floor, where, where to go out. Now, it does use GPS and all that. So, you know, you might not get room 401 versus 402, but you'll know where that emergency is and where to respond to. 
So that's how that works. Any questions on that? Yeah, but I'm sure we need a lot more time to explain it to me. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just say I really this. want to know how you can see through walls. Yeah. So what we do is, can you see on the left phone mm -hmm. how there's a little circle at the bottom right-hand corner? I see that. So you're the white dot in the middle, and then you can see all the red dots and blue dots around the perimeter. Right. And so you just stand and you pivot, and you can see the distance. Okay. And the cool thing is, all you have to do to get there is that screen I showed you in the previous screen. So um, let me go back here. So this is when you've got an emergency going, right? right? If you click on any one of those, on chat, audio, or video, you click on any one of those, you get bumped over to this next screen. Mm -hmm. And in that screen, obviously, if you have a text, that's going and, and whatnot. If not at the top, you can see on the phone on the right, you've got a standard view, mm -hmm. a hybrid view that's got that satellite imagery, and the one on the right says augmented reality. So all you do is click on AR, and you get the screen on the left. Okay. Okay. And it's all there in front of you. And, and the thing is, there's a pin, so you can see exactly what you're doing. And we do train all the administrators, law personnel, we train all them. But um, there's not a very, excuse me, there's not a very high learning curve on a system mm -hmm. like this. No, it looks pretty neat. I know. Augmented reality. <laughs> yeah. Pretty neat, huh? Pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. I could think of a lot of uses for that. This is a product of CDM. <laughs> <laughs> but, you can't. but you can't. It's not x-ray vision. Yeah. So. Yeah. Shoes good. <laughs> Mass broadcast and lockdown notifications. Mm. Again, we don't allow students, and a lot of sites don't want teachers doing this, so it's mostly admin. Mm -hmm. But the way this works in the real world is a teacher will press an SOS button, and they say the student's missing, there's a threat here, there's whatever. The admin will re respond back and forth, and you've got all admin getting that, so you've got you know, safety in numbers if someone's in a meeting. And um, basically what they do is they say, oh, okay, this is what's going on, yeah, that's a real threat, you have a picture, et cetera, et cetera. Then they broadcast this out. So you can send out whatever message you want. You can even have preset messages programmed in there. Then you can add the picture, you can add video, and then you can send it out via the app, text message, email, phone call. And if you've got Twitter and Facebook, we even post to those if you're connected ahead of time. So it catches everyone in every way that you can. And again, we recommend using this mode because if people have a different language on their phone, it'll translate that content in real time. So you don't have to worry about that. And that's a meeting when we had with the cabinet, the ARIES database has the language that people prefer their content in. We will respect those values and accordingly, we'll translate on the back end automatically. And if you've got a particularly soothing voice, you can also do a, a voice recording and send that out so it's not as robotic when people get it by phone. Mm -hmm. But if you do that, you can't have the real-time translation. So you know, you get one or the other there. Any questions about this? But again, what you see is what you get. Broadcast tab on the bottom right, you can see that blue icon selected. All you do is it says your message, you fill it out, Attach a picture if you have one. And then at the top, you can see where it says next. Just click next and it sends out. So, so you're, okay, so a couple of things. Well, I, just on this, um, in terms of broadcasting, you're indicating that there will be a, th th there may be a hierarchy, but that's up to the, that's up to the district how to, I yes. mean, so the right way that now, it works. We have lock, you have a lockdown, yes. only certain people can call a lockdown. Yes. Versus, I know that we're talking about that anybody anywhere on a campus can call a lockdown. We're giving the freedom to be able to no, call No, we're it. not allowing anyone to do a lockdown. So mm -hmm. what we do. But uh, oh. isn't that what we're, yeah, please, okay. Please. So yeah, just clarify. So uh, one of the great things about Titan is that Vic and his team will customize okay. um, however we want to uh, create broadcasts. And uh, right now, it's it's two-way communication internally with staff and district hierarchy. Got it. Okay. Uh, with parents, it would simply be broadcast messaging. Got it. Uh, okay. We will also be working with Vic to create the teams. Uh, for example, we're going to have tight. We've already got uh, the crisis response team using Titan. We have school sites using Titan. Um, we're planning to have uh, different divisions and departments that typically heretofore hadn't used Titan using Titan. Uh, so there's going to be a training and a scale-up um, schedule that, that we're going to work on. We will be working with law enforcement, too, to get their recommendations on. Uh, they obviously have communication systems and teams that they use uh, when they're in a crisis response mode or an incident command situation. So we'll be, we'll be having a lot of conversations okay. over the summer, developing a training schedule, developing teaming schedules. Uh, and, and, and then scaling up who's going to have what kind of access. Okay. But that still has to be worked out. And the other, and I'm sorry, the other question was, I know that when I went to the CSEA leadership, um, one, of their, one of their concerns was, you know, the grounds people are out there working and there's a lockdown, hello, but they're not notified. Right. Um, so 
I'm assuming that you're having conversations with with letting people know who, you know, if, if so, there's somebody on the campus that yeah. is doing is mowing the lawn, who can't that hear anything. They can't hear anything, so our, or it doesn't have it. We've got to make sure that that. Yeah, our girl, goal. Okay. Is every employee in the district is going to be trained on Titan? Okay. Every okay. division. You almost have. To. Every office. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, so they'll be right. notified. Mass notifications, emergency communications, um, needs to happen. I think the two variables that Vic pointed out that we're really impressed with is throughput time, how quickly does it take to get to people, and how easy it is to use. So, so you have everyone from very highly specialized personnel to, um, to everyone else throughout the district who is going to have access to this very user-friendly system. Uh, and um, in fact, I did a CSEA uh, uh, shadow day. Uh, with this fine gentleman right behind me. <laughs> yeah, so it's you, Stu. It's, it's, it's you, buddy. Yeah, it's you. Yeah. Right? Jeez. Anyways, and we, he talk, we talked, we had a great conversation about emergency notifications, and I yeah. was talking to you about Titan, and uh, I, think, I think you find value in the system as well. And so we're very excited okay, that good. people like Stu and, and people in, in his area of work who support all of us working together to support students and families, we're all going to be tied into this system. Great. Okay. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. No worries. And again, the system is completely customizable. We're not here to uh, instigate or determine protocol. We're just here to offer the communication tool. Perfect. So for example, some sites, you know, the typical deployment will be the principal will sit on top of their sites, but the district can sit on top of everything and push down to all sites. Um, there's complete customizability. Another thing you can do that some sites do, we haven't done an NMUSD, but we could, is if you had something like a graduation or a school game or whatever, you could even have a campus code people text when they get there. They're loaded into the system, and if you sent out a notification, when you're sending out broadcasts, you can select students, parents, teachers, and you could select guests. And so you could even have people who time out. So if you've got a battle of the bay, people just text the code when they're there, they're in for the night, then they're out the next day. So it's oh. completely mm. customizable wow. to whatever you need. And again, in those emergencies, you don't need to have every single person know if, mm. you know, yeah, forty percent of the people on that football field at Battle of the Bay are people who are in the system, and the rest are just neighbors. Mm -hmm. If forty percent know, then they'll yeah. call the people right. Then somebody will know. You know, so so that's how that system works. That's cool. When you were talking about connectivity, if you can make it work at CDM, you can make it work anywhere. It's harder. Than yeah, that, that Wi-Fi networking. Stuff. And the that's cell that. networks there are really phone. poor too. I actually switched from AT&T to T-Mobile because of East that. East yeah. is just yeah. horrible. It's crazy. Non-existent the network there. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but it's been used at CDM successfully for many years. So. Emergency materials. This is an example of what this section looks like. So this is a site map. You can upload these documents, even pull in from Dropbox, things like that. Um, again, you can here, see here it's been uploaded only to the admins, but you could add it for guests, non, whoever you want. And then in an actual emergency, things that maybe you don't want out there daily, like a site map. Well, if there's an actual emergency, maybe you don't care as much. And so you can go into the emergency material and hit send and push it out to whatever user types that you want to send it to. So it's all about empowering you guys to do whatever you need to do yeah. when the time is right from the palm of your hand. Yeah, exactly. So that's basically the system in a nutshell. I'd Perfect. love to answer any Perfect. questions you guys have Great. and go from there. Okay. Too many. Uh, yeah, you did a Just really cool. nice yeah, <laughs> oh presentation here. Does anybody have any comments? Ms. Elsie. Well, uh, if there are no comments, I just want to say I have to recuse myself on this because I am on his advisory board. Okay. But I also want to say how proud I am of him and his whole team. He came to me several years. Yeah, four, four or five, five years ago. Five years ago, yeah. um, and wanted to beta test it. We were talking about beta testing math programs at CDM, and um, it was fortunate that that worked out. And what, when you see him here with his enthusiasm, yeah. he's like this 20 hours a day. <laughs> I give you four hours to sleep. <laughs> but he really is, and he and his team are working so hard on this. And he's obviously not going to go into all the other companies and colleges and schools he services, but it's pretty amazing what they've done. Pretty and cool. uh, That's great. So. Mrs. Floor. I just have a question because, I, again, I'm pulling up the contract here. Sure. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I just said, okay, got it, 90000 but it has zero in the, to the total cost, yearly cost. Yeah. And so I just want to understand that. So this is a place where we've, I've done so many things to try and give back to the community. The story that I'll give you is when I was in high school, I actually got an internship through Mrs. Hath and Ms. Levitri, who's now Ms. Hughes. 
with the city manager, Homer Bluedow. And okay. he invested so much in me all those years, and then Dave Kiff did afterwards with senior projects and things like that. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I used to try and do things, and you know, we were socialized well in Newport Beach, so you know, you'd take a box of chalk to say thank you or this time. I mean, really, as a 16 year old, there's not much you can do, you know? And I would say, what can I do, what can I do? And they, and they always said, pay it back forward sometime when you can. And so now, fortunately, I feel very blessed to be in a position where we can do that. And on our advisory board, um, I actually have the person I interned for, the city manager of Newport Beach, now works for me. So, you know, we've come around full circle over the last 10 to 15 years. This Amazing. is a true NMUSD story, right? Wow. And Amazing. so what I wanted to do with this is, you know, we, we sell this technology in the private sector for about $10 per user per month. So, I mean, the cost of something like this, it's, it's built, we're, we're talking about securing military bases, mm -hmm. right? I mean, okay. so yeah. if it came down to cost, I mean, this district seems like they're doing okay, but it, the educational sector can't afford this technology, yeah. but it's the only place where, it's not a military base, and it's a place that's getting shot up left and right, you know? So we've got to do something. We make enough money off the private sector. You know, the company fortunately does very well. And so with Newport Mesa, what we've wanted to do is donate it back to the community to do something so at least kids feel safe here. And we do all these things. We have the scholarships, we have the mentorship programs. I mean, I write dozens of college apps every year. We have two to three dozen college high school kids that come through us every year. This is the mm -hmm. first year where we had high school kids who graduated have now come back as college students to oh wow. intern with us. Wow. Oh, cool. um, you know, we, when we had the suicide, we bought baked goods for the entire school. I mean, we, mm -hmm. we really care about this community. And mm -hmm. so it's not about money at this site. We just want to do something to help. And, and this is how we're trying to do that. On behalf of the Newport Mesa School District and the whole district, thank Absolutely. you very You're much. <laughs> I, I just wanted to add one more thing because I, would, I was at CDM Awards night last night and they have a new scholarship in honor of Kathy Hath, who we, yes. we, we acknowledge tonight at our retirement party. And it is given by Titan and uh, Vic's law firm. We, so we, have, we have two scholarships at CDM. They're not based on merit, they're based on community service. Oh, um, cool. This past weekend we actually had, a, so I found out there's a lot of human trafficking in Orange County. Yeah. Okay. And so I rounded up the mayor, the DA, and, and we had a gala, 300 people at Pelican Hill to raise money for Orangewood, which I know works for NMU, mm -hmm. with NMUC too. So we're just trying to do something that's good. We can't afford, just based on business, I can't donate it everywhere. But if we can do something here where it matters, and some of the smaller towns in the Midwest, places like that, where they really don't have the money to do something like this, we donate it to those sites too. So we're just trying to make. Thank a you so much. Really Thank appreciate you. you. Okay. So, uh, Any well, other questions? Jeez, I don't even no, know if we need to take a vote. But. Uh, move <laughs> yes, you do. Uh, uh, move, move approval of the memorandum of agreement between. Oh, the would you guys like me? I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Would you guys like to meet two people from the team? Yeah. Sure. Sure. We we do have Ms. Serene Nasser and Mr. Ryan Khalili. Serena Nasser is a vice president of one of the vice presidents of our company, and she does a lot of the trainings for Newport Mesa. Oh. So that's really kind of the gist of what's specialized with her role here. And Ryan Khalili is actually also from my alma mater, UCSD, and he is our lead engineer and has built a product that largely almost every single day, with the exception of a random Walmart phone here and there, maintains a 100% crash free rate, which is wow. four times better Knock than the Apple apps do, Facebook or Amazon apps do. Wow. Wow. So good. wow. wow. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Up late for this. Wow. President Snell, before uh, the board uh, takes a vote, I do want to point out that uh, the agreement that uh, uh, Vic has presented to the board is actually a two year two agreement. Two years. Yeah, I was going to say. And make uh, on the uh, description on the agenda item, it stated only the 2018 19 oh, year, but I want to years. point out it's two years. I was gonna so for the record, I was making uh, that amendment because sure I saw 2018 that. Yeah. 20. It's 2000. Yeah, so so um, 2020. Uh, approve the memorandum of agreement between the Newport Mesa Unified School District and Titan 20. HST Incorporated as the district's emergency notification 20. system for all schools and departments in, um, in the 2018 2020 uh, school years. Second. Okay. So. Uh, Mrs. Flores made the motion, and Ms. Matoye has seconded, um, and I, I know you're Stay. abstaining. Ms. Yelsey is abstaining, so all in favor. Aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so thank much. You. Time. Thank you. And thank you for staying till 10 o'clock. <laughs> Wait, just for the record, uh, Mrs. Yelsey recused. Oh, for the record, Mrs. Yelsey recused, recused. herself. Okay, 20 point D, um, adopt resolution um, number 380618 regarding layoff of classified employees. 
Good Ms. evening. Solson. Yes. Um, each year, we sites need to reevaluate um, their funding as well as the work that is occurring. And in this particular case, we're bringing forward to you a resolution. We have three positions within the classified um, area, an instructional assistant, instructional assistant student development, and an instructional <coughs> assistant technology one where there is lack of work or a lack of funds. And so this resolution is the process in which to um, lay off those classified employees. I will share with you that our staff, Kristen Clark, as well as Pam Saunders from um, CSEA has met with each of these individuals to talk about the impact and talk about the choices that they have um, available to, to them. So tonight we ask that you approve this resolution. Move adoption of resolution 380618 regarding layoff of classified employees. Second. Okay, so um, it's been moved by Ms. Floor and seconded by Mrs. Yelsey. And this is a roll call vote. Okay. Ms. Snell? Yes. Ms. Matoyer? Yes. Ms. Floor? Yes. Mr. Davenport? <coughs> yes. Ms. Franco? Yes. Ms. Black? Yes. Ms. Yelsey? Yes. Okay, great. Um, now we're going to move to board member reports. It's now I'm going to have to go because um, I've left my mom there without anybody. So oh, okay, and she's desperately oh, trying understand. to text me. So oh, you know, oh, I apologize understand. that no, I can't stay through. But yeah, it's no going late. Thank you. Mrs. I Bob. know she's okay because she's texting me. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm yeah. just a little nervous. She's not little, texting little you. Nervous. I've fallen. Is she? <laughs> I know. Yeah. She's not falling. Little. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. You have uh, to get her on that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Take care. Okay. Mrs. Yelsey. Um, yeah, it, it is late, and I, you know, I don't want to so take much. too much. I don't want to take too much time, and we've had so much time since our last board meeting. Mm -hmm. Everything that's been happening has been really good things. I think we've all been to so many award ceremonies, already a graduation, <clears throat> all kinds of things. Um, I hate to cut short all this, but... Um, <laughs> Go for it. Okay. I'll, I'll just mention a few. Uh, okay. Several of us went to an AP Environmental Science Project presentation at Estancia High School, and this was from the AP Environmental classes at Costa Mesa and Estancia. And um, Ms. Rasmussen started this a couple of years ago when we were working with the Banning Lanch, Ranch Land Trust. And now it's taken over by another organization since that closed. But these projects were, were really amazing. And just as an example, one of the things that I learned that I didn't know <laughs> is they, uh, someone did a study of, um, of uh, miracle Grow versus fruit waste. It was called Decidus. Detritus. 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 Okay. Um, and they found out that banana peels, apple, all that kind of stuff works better than miracle Grow in helping plants grow. Ooh, interesting. And they were all very hands-on projects like this. It was really interesting. Cool. Cool. And I know they would like to spread that to all our high schools, so I think at some point this summer they'd like to meet with uh, district staff to mm. see how they can get oh. that kind of program in our other schools. Um, <laughs> I went to East Bluff Open House the other night, and the reason I mentioned that specifically is they had a grand opening of their new maker space, mm -hmm. and they call it, because they are the East Bluff Otters, it's called the Otter Space, <laughs> with a big <laughs> sign that's been very painted cute. on the wall, and it's really very cool. Um, everyone was super impressed. It was packed, and that was really nice. And then earlier in the evening, I had gone in to a Chromebook discussion mm -hmm. with the fourth grade parents, because they're kids will get them next year and they were all simply amazed and enthused that they were getting it they didn't know that they were literally the last people to get it but, <laughs> but everybody is very excited Good. to finally uh, get that program over there um, I also uh, spent one of my days last week doing senior projects at CDM amazing projects amazing presentations from some of these kids uh, you know we're really in good hands with some of the the areas and the um, avenues that the kids mm -hmm. want to take mm -hmm. from our schools. So that was pretty cool. 
I went to NCE for a flag deck because they have a what they call a trifecta this year. They were a distinguished school, an exemplary arts school, and they received a platinum award from PBIS um, right. coalition. So that was, I mean, in one year to have three things at a school like that was really impressive. And they had two of their kids that they gave scholarships to from CDM who came back. They each presented them each with a $1,000 scholarship, but they also talked to the kids. And these little kids sitting on the blacktop <laughs> were in awe of these high school seniors who were saying, I used to play on those monkey bars <laughs> and I couldn't get across the monkey bars when I first started. And so my dad took me to the park every day and we would practice and we would practice and it was that resiliency that made me get across. Oh. And that's what I've used ever since throughout my career up to now. I mean, really, they were model <laughs> students. It was amazing. Um, cool. So it was all wonderful. And the rest, are lots of awards, special mm -hmm. things, Special Olympics, which was fabulous once again. Um, and you guys can finish the rest. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mrs. Franco. No report. Mr. Davenport. No report this evening. Mrs. Fleur. Well, I think the highlight um, uh, for me was attending the early college high school at this point in time the early college high school um, graduation which was amazing all students every single one of them is going on to college except for two who are joining the military one young woman is joining the Marines and one young woman is going uh, one young man is going into the army so every single one of those graduates is going somewhere and men, you know all over a large number are going into nursing mm -hmm. which was fabulous um, and then had the opportunity to participate um, and, and witness the award ceremony at back bay which is some of our most challenging students and as van said over a hundred thousand dollars was um, given in scholarships to the students over there, and it was just fabulous. So, those are, those are my two. Yeah. I, you, I agree with Mrs. Yelsey. I've got a list that's so long, I don't know when I slept, but I wanted to say that I attended the special ed prom, which was really fun, although I didn't have my poodle skirt, skirt nor my pink ladies jacket, but it was a 50s theme, and the kids were having a great time. They had, and thank you to NMFT Retired for their sponsorship for that because oh. that's a pretty neat thing that happens. Um, Mrs. Snell and I went to the robotics competition. Every year it gets better. The kudos were from the entire ed tech team, but everyone focused and said congratulations to Christy Darnell because that's her baby and that's what she does. And this year, it it's, it's amazing. I didn't quite realize that they know the children learn the students ahead of time know what their their challenges are going to be so then they build their robots to be able to handle that challenge so they're different and they program them to be able to handle that challenge and to watch them perform the challenges and get frustrated like we do because it's all technology and it's computers but it's so exciting in the the stands were full of parents, so and food trucks came. We missed the food trucks, but that's okay. Um, we also both attended with Mrs. Yelsey the Soy Awards, and Soy is Save Our, Save Our Youth, and it's an organization that was started by Jean Forbath a long time ago, but has worked its way up. They're housed at, the, it's a youth center that's housed at our um, best center, and they provide all sorts of opportunities for kids, but they they gave $150,000 in scholarships that night. I know that's what I said. I went, wow, that is so cool. And there was the awards. Do you want to talk about them? Or? Mm, go ahead. Okay. Sure. The, the Estancia High School Awards, we go to all, I'm going to Mason next week, blah, blah, blah. It's, yeah. But it's just so wonderful because this is why we're in the business for, for, for the kids. And what's even more exciting is when one child wins an award, three or four kids that are there get excited for the child that wins the award. So you see that giving and taking all the time. And next week I'm gonna be attending a flag deck at Sonora Elementary School. And they have yeah. the high school seniors, after they've received their caps and gowns, will come back in their cap and gown 
and parade through a flag deck to pomp and so cir cool. circumstance so, cool. so that all talk about kids because now they're all decked out in their garb and <coughs> it gives a first hand response i don't care how much we teachers and educators can tell the kids work hard do everything else but these are their friends their family and they're graduating and the message is you can't too this is what you have to do so i'm done mrs <laughs> yelsey yeah i just have one more thing um i just got a text from someone who was at the C um, newport beach city council meeting tonight and they approve funding another half of a school resource office. Oh, yay. Yay. We put it out there. So Just breaking we, news. Yay, breaking, breaking news. news. So if we can yes. find the other half. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. There Good goes your them. budget, Jeff. <laughs> yeah. Good for them. <laughs> okay. There well, goes that line. It, I, everything has sort of been mentioned as Ms. Batoye talks about. Mm -hmm. This is the smile season. And um, when I was wearing my Fitbit, I'm not wearing it anymore. Um, I loved it because I would get steps every time I clapped. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's was a good year. Thousand, yeah, yeah. So it is. It's it's a great great um, time of year. It's busy and but it's so fulfilling. Um, I just want to mention the Newport Harbor High School Jazz Picnic, which was Sunday, oh, yeah. and it was a really nice. Um, well, the horn, one of the horn players was having a little trouble, and uh, I found out, well, they announced he had had um, braces oh. put on his bottom teeth like two days before, and he's trying to play a trumpet. Can you oh, imagine? You can't so, but they're so talented, and they, they have won many awards and traveled nationally <laughs> to play. So, um, yeah, it was, a great, it's, it was a great, it's been a great few weeks. So, moving on. Uh, you have committee reports? Oh, I oh, do. Yeah. Committee reports. Sorry. Um, the ROP, I just wanted to let you know that apparently in the budget, there is um, funding that's been granted, not as much as we want, but they've got the 300 million, half of it, 150,000 will go, 150 million will go to CTIG, and the rest of it will go to, which is the uh, California Incentive Grant Program for for our for school districts to apply, and ROP will apply, of course. Um, and CTIG, it's Career Technical Education okay. Incentive Grant. Grant. There Thank you go. You. Um, they call it CTIG. And the other $150 million will be going to Workplace Innovation, which is going to the community college. With the understanding it's supposed to be passed down to the... Uh, K-12, but yeah, not going to happen. Um, and we're having our meeting on uh, Friday this um, this week because all of the other schools in our district, uh, in our uh, consortium, um, our JUA, are graduating. And on that note, I just want to let you know that our students, um, we are having um, summer school. Um, but our students in Newport Mesa do not have the opportunity to participate except in culinary and or at the uh, 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 crop site because all of the other all of the other uh, classes Start which is already. yeah which are starting um, oh by the way oh let's when are they starting the 18th um, and those are all uh, draw the the um, engineering Several engineering classes, several of the computer and ma um, music technology <coughs> classes, a lot of classes are being offered um, at all of the different sites and all the within the district, but our kids can't participate because they are still in school. Hmm. Okay. So, okay. That's Dr. Navarro. Just real quickly, I wanted to jump on the Ed Bell bandwagon. And let you know that you know one of the things what he talked about was you know Sean's this really amazing mm -hmm. passionate leader mm -hmm. and um, you know he was uh, he had some good instincts when Project Hope Alliance came his way mm -hmm. yeah you know I didn't know what it was it sounded good theoretically I thought okay mm -hmm. that could that could work but he really just had some faith and you know and now we're thinking about working with them and while well, we're working with them and we're hoping to spread it to other schools in the district so I think that's what Ed was talking about you know he's got this mm -hmm. real sense about what could be good for for kids and what mm -hmm. could be good for the school and you know and uh and none of us are perfect but you know i think overall i think i really admire what what he what he did in that arena and and that the way uh, ed ca uh, characterized mm -hmm. it is, is pretty good yes this whole letter is wonderful miss olson mm, miss holcomb mr yep. holcomb 
<laughs> no report. Mr. Trader. No report. Okay. Good run and roll, Dr. Bell. I've said enough. <laughs> you said enough. <laughs> You've cost us enough this shit today. <laughs> you have. I know. <laughs> I can't oh. do it. It's Just real quickly, uh -huh. tomorrow, oh, lights are going off. I tomorrow know. we <laughs> have our uh, a community advisory, yeah. special mm -hmm. educator well, that's right. tea. Um, over at Early College, we have over um, 100 uh, folks who were nominated by mm. parents and students. And so it's uh, administrators, teachers, lots of classified staff, aides, bus drivers, sometimes custodians. So it's a great event, and uh, we're looking forward to hopefully seeing some of you there tomorrow. Great. We'll Thank be you. here. We'll be there. Move adjournment. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you.